The magic you are looking for is in the work you're avoiding. What does that mean? Often, the exercises that you don't do or you avoid are the ones that are going to give you the most gains. Look, if you've been working out for a while, especially if you've been working out for a while and you remember those newbie gains that you got when you first started working out, you can tap into those by doing exercises you're not good at. Often, the exercises you hate the most. So stop avoiding them. Pick them up. Practice them. Watch what happens to your body. We're literally creatures of habit. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys remember when you pieced this together? Do you remember like what exercise it was that you had been avoiding or muscle group or what? Like you remember avoiding pull something? 100%. Uh, really? I pull hate, ups. Dude, I hate, I hate pull-ups. It's because you have those heavy cakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I focused on that. It took like me like a, a few, a few months of just deliberate attention uh, to, to finally get decent at them again. But like, that was one I was always mad. Cause it was like the presidential physical fitness. Oh. And that was like one of the standard ones. Yeah. I always like, didn't do well. I did well on everything else except for that. And I just ugh, always used to get, did at you me. get the presidential fitness award? Mm -hmm. You did get it. I did yeah. get it. So that was the hardest one for you. That was, was the hardest one. You yeah. know, which one was for me? What? The stupidest one. I did. I aced everything else. It was a sit, sit and reach. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I can see that. It made me so mad. It's yeah. like the dumbest one. He's <laughs> the flexible one. guy. Yeah, yeah. All the do everybody was able to do the sit and reach. And here I am, I crush and pull ups and I can run and do everything. <laughs> uh -huh. And then they're, I'm like, I can barely get to this a lot. And I was so mad. Yeah. So did you get Did you get that? Yeah, the sit. I did terrible the sit and reach too. Exact same thing. Did, did you, did you I, get the national or president? No, no, no. I didn't win. I didn't. No, I didn't win. But I remember that, or I didn't. I don't remember what category I felt because like, I remember. Because remember, it was presidential and then national. Yeah, I don't remember what what it was. I did well on it though. You got local. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's actually a good question. I don't. But I do remember the sit and reach not being great. At that I crushed pull ups. I remember being really good. At, I, I crushed the sit ups. I remember that. Like, but was but it, what is it? Sit ups, push ups, push ups, pull ups, pull ups. Then for girls, mile it was a head, run, mile run. Then it was a mile yeah. run. Mile yeah, run. and the mile run, run. I did. I was. Really, I still remember I my num that. my number for the for the run for the mile. I ran a six something like really fat. Man, remember, now keep in mind, I weighed like twenty five pounds. I ran under six. So, I ran a five fifty something. Wow. Yeah, five fifty two wow. or five fifty six something. That's like right. Yeah. I yeah. So, six. you know, the, the first time I figured this out, I actually remember specifically, it's so weird. It just popped in my head when you said this. Um, I, I worked out in the backyard when I was a kid and we, my dad had a basic weight set. So it was a bench and it was one of those Olympic bench yeah. sets. The, the sand filled ones. No, no, this, these were iron. So this is when oh, my, okay. so I had the first weights I used were the cement ones, but my dad had the iron ones in the backyard and I wasn't allowed to use them until I was like 14 and a half or whatever. So then I was finally able to use them. And it was the one with the leg extension, you know, part uh, attachment. It's all wobbly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And <clears throat> I went out there and, um, out for, for arms, you know, I did all the exercises, but for arms, it was always barbell curls, dumbbell curls, barbell curls, dumbbell curls. Okay. And there was this preacher curl attachment that I had to take the leg extension attachment off and then slide the preacher curl on top of it. And I just, I just didn't do it cause I didn't know mm. how, and I just avoided it or whatever. So for, I don't know, six months or so it was dumbbell curls, barbell curls back and forth. And then <clears throat> I remember I was reading an article, uh, about Larry Scott, the first Mr. Olympia. And he was all about the preacher curl. He talked about how that made his arm so big. So I'm like, I, I think I can, I have that in the backyard. So I looked around, it was all dusty, pull, put it in there, took out the leg extension, took me forever to figure out, put it in, did preacher. And I sucked so bad because the preacher curls, the tension is at the bottom because of the angle, right? Mm -hmm. So with the barbell curl, it's like pretty easy from the bottom up to mid range, but with the preacher curl all the way down, I, I had to go way light and I couldn't do it and I hated it. But because Larry Scott had these amazing arms, I stuck with it and I'll never forget within weeks, I saw my arms progress so fast Yeah, and I, and I, I started to piece together like, huh, is, I wonder if it's because I sucked so bad at it that I'm, I'm getting this, this progress. And so- from then on, it was just like, um, you know, this kind of dysfunctional relationship where I would realize it by doing something and then I still wouldn't do it because nobody wants to suck it at an exercise. I think that's the problem. No, I, I especially a young, insecure teenage boy, right? 100%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I totally get that. I mean, I, I feel like so many lifts I experienced this with, all, especially all the big ones. I mean, I hated bench press. So yeah. I avoided bench press forever. Finally got... Decent at bench press, saw huge gains. That's in rare, my, by the way, my, a, a young man avoiding bench yeah, press. Yeah, because my form was so terrible and I was so weak. I was so embarrassed that I couldn't even put the 45s on. And all my buddies in high school and stuff could do that. And I couldn't do that. Like that just drove me crazy that I had to go put the quarters on there, which they, they seem 
tiny, tiny, tiny when you're used to the 45 plate. So, I mean, avoided that forever. I avoided they didn't have the CrossFit weights back then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah they didn't <laughs> the have that. Back. You're right. Like, they, didn't, they, yeah. they didn't have that. So, I mean, I, I remember that. I remember uh, never squatting, always leg pressing and leg extension. And then I remember squatting. And then I remember never deadlifting and then deadlifting. Like, I remember never a barbell overhead press. And then I did that. Like, I had so many. I remember incline bench. Like, there were so many moments in my lifting career where I had to learn that lesson of like, oh, man, there's some huge value in seeking novelty and training, especially as you as you get more advanced like when you're so new you can almost do anything <coughs> lifting yeah. wise and the and it's so long as you're you got a good diet put together and you you train well exercise selection and programming is is less important it's always important but it's less important then when you get into lifting for a long time and you've put two years plus under your belt of consistency now this gets really important that you you know learning that man seeking out these movements that I, I suck at and that is novel to the body, man, there's massive gains there, even though you, but you have yeah. to just go through the, the mental struggle of I'm going to suck at this. I'm going to have to be light in the weight and, and be shitty for a month or two at it. But boy, that's where the gains. The lie. last time yeah. I did that was as an adult. Um, I, I love, you know, I was bar barbell squatting at a young age. It's a, you know, exercise I was pretty good at. And then there was the video, and so I was, I was an adult, so it was after we knew, we met Paul Check, and there was a video of him doing walking lunges, mm. I don't know what it was, like 250 pounds or something like that. And I remember uh, Kyle Kingsbury told us also, he's like, oh my God, I tried to work out with him, he did walking lunges with a like, tremendous amount of weight. And, and I sucked at lunges, I sucked at the split stance, mm. it just... Mm -hmm. I could squat 350 pounds, but you know, you put more than you know 120 pounds on my back with walking lunges, and I just... Didn't have the stability, so I that's all I practiced and practiced and practiced them for a while, and I got to the point where I could go. I mean, up to 185, but I went from 120 something to 185 in like five weeks. Mm -hmm. No way I'd be able to add 50 pounds or yeah, 60 any pounds. Other movement. No, not yeah. not as an adult who's been training for so long. So that's really what you're tapping into, and and you might wonder, people might think, well, why is this happen? How's this happening? Well, no, one is strength and performance is as much of a skill as it is your muscle's ability to contract. Mm -hmm. So the reason why my legs were strong with a squat, one of the reasons I could squat a lot, but I couldn't lunge a lot, was my muscles knew how to organize themselves very well with the squat. They were very efficient with the squat. I practiced it all the time. As soon as I went into a split stance, it was like learning a new dance move. I just, uh, you know, your, your body can't figure it out. I can't output as much power. So there's a lot of CNS adaptation, which by the way, CNS adaptation leads to muscle growth. They're, they're, they go hand in hand. They're like hand in glove. You want both. So if you're getting lots of CNS adaptation, you're like, oh my God, I added 50 pounds to a lift. Oh, it's just because I'm better at the lift. That is going to lead to more muscle growth. And then the second reason is when you look at, and this is, a, you know, this is largely the accepted theory with muscle fiber contraction. When you look at the muscle fibers, the filaments as they pass by each other, I, you know, I was, I was watching an animation of muscle fibers and it looks like the best example I can give is uh, somebody pulling a tug of war rope, like they're, where they're reaching over the rope over and over again. That's kind of what muscle fibers do when they contract. And when they are put under tension, it's like your grip getting broken a little bit at certain points. That damage is part of the muscle building process. That damage is going to be different depending on the angle uh, the, the tension point. So if there's a lot of tension point in the mid range versus at the, at the lengthened range versus the contracted range or isometric versus concentric or eccentric, it's slightly different. And that slight difference elicit is a new signal. It's yeah. a new muscle building signal. This is literally the intermediate and advanced hack. I would say this has to be the number one hack mm -hmm. with intermediate and advanced lifters. To add to that, the the mistake, so I piece that together, and then the next mistake I make is now I'm changing things up all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so, Such a, I'm so glad you said this. So, You're right. so the next level to this tip, or the, the next bit of the under, fully understanding it, is that you still, you but when you change the you know, the exercise or you, or you go after something, you're terrible. you got to stick with it long enough to get those, to get good at it. Yeah. To get good at it. Otherwise, if you're just constantly changing up all the time, then you're not giving the body enough time to really adapt and get good and, and then build that extra muscle. And so 
there there's the key there because that was the the next mistake I made, which was like everywhere you I figured this out, yeah. but then you went too yeah, far. Yeah, I mean that was literally this was like a, a novel a, stimulus every time. This was like a, a a flex of mine, which oh I've never repeat. I'm you know I've been lifting for ten plus yeah. years. I've never repeated the same workout. <laughs> you know, what I'm yeah. like I thought that was such a good thing. Yeah. And I was like, no, it's really not. Like there's t tremendous value in following a routine long enough to maximize the growth and gains from it and then transitioning out of this that. This is why strength training can be, I feel for somebody really trying to figure this out because it can sound so contradictory. It could sound so complex. So somebody hears the novel argument and then they do what you just said. Yeah. I'll do, do every, change everything. And then they hear somebody else is like, no, no, no. Practice these basic exercises, practice them often, get good at them. You'll get the most gains. And it's some really high performing athlete. I'm like, okay, who's right? Yeah. Here's the shitty part. They both are. Yeah. yeah. They both are. And workout programming is a balance of all these different things. And so I think you said it best just now, Adam. Find something new and then practice it long enough to get good at it. Yeah. That's really the thing, mm -hmm. right? Pract it. And then practice something, practice something, practice something. Now I'm good at it. Now I'm strong at it. Now I feel solid at it. Now maybe I can try something else. But there are exercises that have such a long range of benefits that you, all, almost always should have them in at some some in one way, shape, or form, and those are the big lifts that we tend to talk about. Yeah, or come back to it, right? So <laughs> I love yeah, yeah. I love the idea of I'm, God. I remember another one I didn't name Bulgarian split squats. Oh, there was a part of why I avoid, I avoid that one a long time. It was actually same. Yeah. Who wants to go do Bulgarian? They're so difficult, bro. It, you, but yeah, it was so embarrassing. I had to grab <coughs> like twenty pound dumbbells yeah. was the most, and I was just like, that's on, more than me. I was body weight fire. Yeah. But I mean, I was in a in a relatively short period of time. I was able to go from holding twenty pound dumbbells to holding eighty pound dumbbells in yeah. over the course of just a couple of months. Like, and this is yeah. Where else are you going to ten get plus like years yeah. into lifting? Like, I'm that you're not getting. I'm not getting no. that anywhere else. And so, yeah, there's just there's a and then after doing that and then coming back to barbell back squats again. Right. So I love to take uh you know take the core lifts that we always talk about. Find a lift within those lifts that you don't. For example, mm -hmm. let's use overhead press, Z press. You never got good Z press before? Go get really good at the Z press for, say, you know, three months. Then go back and do your bar. And watch bar. the carry. Yeah, work. and then do, yeah. go back. If you haven't done, you know, Bulgarian split squats dedicated for, you know, a three-month block of getting really good at it, do that. Then come back to barbell back squats. Like, interrupt those, those core four or five lifts that we always talk about with these novel uh, variations of them or similar right. to them and then revisit that and see what what you get Deficit yeah, deadlifts then back to deadlifts or like my fair was uh front squats yes to, to then uh back yes. squats like i know like that's always one that it seems like an obvious um exercise that people should like just keep on their radar and it just it tends to fall to the cracks because it's hard it's very yes. challenging and especially to like uh you know, there's there's p different positions now. You can hold it so it's not so demanding on the wrists and you don't have to have the mobility for it. But in terms of the overall value of it and what you're going to get from that in terms of like your overall strength and squatting, it's it's phenomenal. And you have to consider Dude, it always. Yeah. By the way, I, you know, real quick, here's your, here's your hint uh, that you may have experienced what we're talking about. If you've been working out for a while, you know exactly, you've probably experienced this, where you'll do a new exercise or a new rep range or you do the same exercise in a different way with a pause or change the tempo and all of a sudden you get sore. Not that soreness is the be all end all signal, but it is interesting that you're fit, you're consistent with your workouts, all you did was change the exercise and all of a sudden you're sore. There's a little there's a hint that this is sending a different signal. I love that you brought front squats up because I remember when so you've heard me share before about my journey with the incline bench press. I feel like front squats are the uh, incline bench press of bench pressing. Meaning yeah. that what ends up happening is so many lifters get good at bench pressing. So good at bench yeah. pressing that their incline press to their bench press, there's such a large discrepancy yeah, gap that they don't want to do it. And even mm -hmm. if they do it, they interrupt it for a little bit and then they're like, oh, back to bench because I can bench 315, but incline I can only do 185 yeah. at best. And so they don't want to have to do that. And so maybe they interrupt it a little bit and then they go back. They never have actually said, okay, I'm going to stay good at this incline bench and see how close to my regular bench I can get. And let me tell you, you can get damn near close, if not the same, as as strong on your incline as you can flat. Pretty damn close. I've done it and saw huge gains from that. Same thing from front and back squat. You get really good at a back squat. You know, you're back squatting 400 pounds, but then you can't do more than 225 front squats. So you get this like, I don't want to do this because I'm so weak. 
But then I went on a kick, same thing with the front squat, of trying to catch my front squat up to my back squat. I never caught all the way up, but I got close, and that was some of the best gains I ever seen on my legs yeah, was doing crazy. that. Today's program giveaway is our new program, MAPS Old Time Strength. If you want to win it, you got to do this. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We're also running a sale on some workout programs. MAPS Bands is half off and the Hard Gainer Bundle is half off. Both 50% off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Speaking of strength, so I've brought this person up before on the podcast and uh, I just learned something new about them. They're just a, they're a fascinating a a athlete. The, 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 this athlete was a Greco-Roman wrestler from the Soviet Union, Alexander Karolin. I've talked about him before, the Russian, Russian bear. bear. Um, I don't remember what his record was, but it was something ridiculous in, in, in international competition. It was like 800 matches, no losses. He was so strong uh, and just so scary strong. I knew a guy who was an Olympic alternate. So this guy's a badass at Greco. Went to Russia. Well, and this was well past Alexander's uh, retirement. So he was like retired. I think he was a mayor of a city at this point. He's in his uh, 60s maybe. And he went and met the guy, the guy and Alexander gave some seminar and he, the guy and Alexander messed, like they were kind of messing around, you know, doing some drills. And he's like, bro, he goes, I went home and he goes, I had bruises everywhere he touched me. It's like, he was so strong. <laughs> anyway, this is true. You ready for this? No chill. This yeah. is crazy. Okay. You guys know the world's strongest man competition. World's strongest man competition. Obviously when you're getting to the level of your, where you're competing at the European championships or the North American championships, and of course the world championships, you're talking about the strongest people in the world and they train specifically for that sport. You're not on, you're not going to run to an accidental strong person. This is like, they train for this. Okay. He decided, Alexander Carolyn decided I'm going to enter into the European world's strongest man competition after he was done with wrestling. Okay. No training, nothing, just a wrestler. He goes in, he gets eighth place <laughs> in the European, which by the way, the European, uh, that's where strong, all strong men are. That's where some of the strongest yeah. athletes so are. So he didn't even really train no. up to that. He went in there and got eighth place. I, just, I read this the other day. That is in just raw strength, just Pull, inhuman. Yeah, yeah, how crazy. Yeah. That now there was more than eight people in the competition. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted. To, I got a tournament like that once. I, tell you that. I got third yeah. place out of three. The, so <laughs> when competing was, was so annoying. So when like bodybuilding bikini was first like new on the scene, I remember there was like some competitions that I went to that were they used to be so small. There's like, some gymnastic competitions. You come and you get like a, a trophy and it's like you, you get like a third place trophy. There was only three people in your class. You <laughs> yeah. know what I'm saying? Like that happened a lot. Like early, I wonder how many early. people tell people of their third place oh, win, but don't tell them Trust that. me, I've been around people that I people was there to watch them get that and like brag they're about you know, bragging about the third place trophy and it's just like, well, there was only three people there, so it's kinda <laughs> Hey, here's some cool news. First time in, I think it's been over six years since, uh, well, definitely all of us, long or not, that we've all are heading out to Olympia. Oh, every yeah. Year, every year, we get requests to uh, show up to these competitions. We always talk about how, Justin's oh, competing finally. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe we will, or we've had a couple where we were about to. Waiting for my I think around skivvies. COVID, we were planning to go, and then that fell through, and so... We are coming out to Florida for uh, Olympia. We will be with the Transcend Group. So I know we're going to organize um, like a meet and greet out there at their booth. I believe they have one of the largest booths there, I believe. Uh, I you know? I haven't been to an Olympia so. con like fitness convention. Yeah, when was the last time? In, oh, you, I don't think you ever have. I mean, never. Have you ever been to any of them? Fit, like uh, Arnold? Yeah, Arnold. You yeah. we went to the Arnold. We Arnold. You went to Arnold? Us? We didn't actually yeah. go to the events, though. When did we go uh, to an Arnold? They are, well... We didn't actually go to the Arnold. Well, we're okay. supposed to. I, I was on my way to the Arnold. <laughs> it got canceled. Yeah, we were. We went. We didn't go to twenty twenty. That yeah, was so the year we had the the we had. I've the been to, I, dude, I've been to fit expos. Like, it doesn't know, count. If no, you haven't been to an Arnold or no. Olympia, those are the big. Those ones. are crazy. All right, well, yeah. Adam and I went to the uh, the one in San. Guess I'm together, missing out. Right? Wasn't it here? Yeah, I've been to. I mean, I've been, I've been to obviously quite. Well, a few you of have. Yeah, yeah, I've been to quite a few. But you and I went together to the one here. We went to the San Jose Expo that they had here. Um which, by the way, they reached out to us to, to do something with them. Um, okay. But we have you and I haven't done Olympia or Arnold. Yeah. Yet, I went to the which Olymp are like way bigger. I went to the Olympia. Them. It's got to be at least 14, 15 years ago. Yeah. It's been a long time. My favorite part of the last fitness expo I was at was the bang booth. 
They had like <laughs> they had like <laughs> girls on like oh that poles was and stuff. It's so that cute. was pretty hilarious. What was that? That was one of the big ones. Yeah, it was San Jose. Oh, he did go. To was yeah. that San Jose? That one? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we all went. Yeah. Oh, that was the San Jose one. For some reason, Gigi I thought that Mufu was like, was there, and yeah. yeah, there was. It was mildly entertaining to, yeah. to see. It's uh, they're interesting. They're, I mean, the, the Olympia and the and the Arnold uh, are not just about bodybuilding. There's martial arts. There's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. There's yeah, that arm cool. wrestling and strongman, strongman and powerlifting. And so I've promised a lot of people that uh, you would be there in a wife beater. Wow. Uh, so wow. just you have to come up. through. Dude. Well, just I mean, you don't have to come. promise anything. I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> Whether or not I'm going to have a shirt on look top. Like, I was going to say. Sal getting a pump at a, at a wife beater. Be, no, no, no. On no, the no, ground no, half the time. No way. No, 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 no. I'm not going to walk around in a wife beater, but come I have on. it on. I mean, you'll fit right in. There's going to be a lot of tank tops. Dude. There's going to be a lot of tank tops. At least it's in Florida where it's warm. We should all be in stringers. So when I went to the Arnold, it was in Columbus. It was snow outside. It's cold. Yeah. And dudes are walking in and little stringers and stuff like that. I'm like, come on, dude. <laughs> it's cold. What are you doing? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was let them That's like a uniform. Bro. That's like a mandatory uniform. Yeah. 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 And just, just I miss those days. Guys, you know, people walk around days. like, look at look yeah. how jacked I can't wait, you guys. No, it'll be it's, cool. It'll be cool hanging out uh at the booth. I know Transcend yeah. has one of the larger booths, right? I yeah. believe so. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, I think you started that rumor and then I just went with no, it. No, they told it's us. It's only gonna be fun if people come say hi. You know, make it make it worth our it's time. It's going to be a blast, yeah. dude. I'm I'm excited. I'm excited because this is the first time we've gone uh, together. Uh, well, actually, first time you've ever gone too. Yeah. Period. End of story. So this will be. That's it. Well, I mean, a lot when we went a long time ago, like there was, uh, you know, we did the one too where you and I went down to L.A. and we spoke. That's what it was. It yeah. was the L.A. Expo. We did that too. Yeah. But that was, was early days. Yeah. yeah. A, a lot of them have been when uh, we haven't done it in a long time. So I'm hoping that there's a a really cool turnout, dude. You want to talk about something exciting? Since mm. we're talking about exciting things. I saw a video. I'm going to hijack you, Justin. Oh, man. I, I know what you're going to say. This is the newest. By the way, I did not have this on my Apocalypse bingo card. I mean, we got <laughs> Middle East <laughs> war. Listen, we I've got, been waiting for this, dude. You know, potential nuclear war with Russia. You know, UFOs. Pandemic, UFOs. I'm like, oh, shit. You know. Well, we just had Big the Loch Ness foot. Monster. Loch Ness Monster. Now we got, yeah. A Big new foot video. Sasquatch is back, A guys. new video of Sasquatch. Did you see it? I did see it. I don't know how sold I am on it though. People are on a train. They're like literally on a train. I don't train. know if you'll ever. That's the thing. It's like even if it was like it, it would always look like a guy in a suit. Like yeah. there's no way you can't. You yeah. know, like it's it's never a good video. It's no, never, well, no. It's it's from that's because they're far interdimensional away. beings. Uh, yeah, Doug. yeah. They, they do. Can you play the video again? Because I did see. It. I mean, you and he see like it, he like he sits down and blends yeah. in. Yeah. You know, so he squats the background. Down. Yeah, he's like walking in like a. He was more camo with his uh, fur. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that would be such a, a great troll right there too. You know, when a train goes by, like go put your bigfoot suit on yeah. and then act all. Like, I mean, did you guys? Did you guys true. like honestly as kids like believe in any of these like mystical creatures? One hut. No, I believe yes. I literally believed in Bigfoot. Yes. Yeah, I, I I'm not ashamed to admit yes. that. Yes. I yeah. well hold on a second. What do you mean believed? Yeah. I mean I still do. Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean there's I, mean, I still think there's I something. literally went okay, so there's in Northern California there's like a bunch of museums like all the way up yeah. to like Eureka. Yeah. We went to like all of them. Yeah. yeah. My mom took me. Yeah, because She's, you were so upset. She loved to like, yeah. Yeah, I was. I was like really into it. Did you hear the story? Of course you did, because you're. I was. I was a fanatic too about Bigfoot. There's one story that's terrifying. So all the stories of Bigfoot, if you read about the encounters, almost all of them are like, I saw him, I smelled him, he makes this a sound. They have a, There's a specific uh, yeah, the knocking noises, and, knocking noises. Yeah. But there's one in particular where there were campers that got attacked, mm. where he, where the Bigfoot was throwing boulders at them, yeah. and then came and chase them. And I was reading this book as a kid because uh -huh. I had all these unsolved mysteries books, right? With all yeah. the like, like the Loch Ness Monster, the Bermuda Triangle. And this one, when I'm reading the story, remember, keep in mind, I'm like seven maybe. Yeah. And I'm reading, I'm all into it. And I turn the page and it's a scary ass picture. It's an illustration uh -huh. of Bigfoot. And it fucked me up for a while. <laughs> yeah. I still remember his face. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, my bro one of my brother's friends we went camping with, like he had this crazy story of the night before. We all heard the noise and I was just thought it was like some wild animal or something. And he just 
just still to this day claims like he smelled that like putrid skunk like stinky yeah. smell went out to kind of check out and then like he said it like roar, like roared and, and like scared the living shit out of him and it ran did off did you ever watch that show um uh on i don't remember what channel it was on it was like uh, a hidden camera like show where they would play pranks on people but it was all about scaring the shit out of people uh-huh I think they had to cancel it, in fact, because... Oh, scare tactics. Scare tactics. Yeah. There was one where they went, they went, they were in a camper and they did a Bigfoot one. I saw that, yeah. And somebody in a realistic, like a realistic Bigfoot, like costume. And so they were scaring the shit. Shaking the camper shell. They opened the, like the drapes to the window and it's a Bigfoot face and the freaking, and the guy and the girl, like they, if they could have crawled through the wall, they would have. Like they they were so Uh terrified. Uh It was so, it was really good. Yeah. Yeah. That stuff. (laughs) That stuff. I love it, dude. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting <laughs> stuff. Anyway, I um I wanted to tell you guys about so we work with Seed, right? Probiotic company. I sent them an email because I wanted details on the uniqueness of their their capsules. And so here's what they sent me. Okay. So here's why Seed is for people who've tried it and they are like, this works differently than other probiotics. Here's what it is. They have a capsule that they've registered, so nobody else owns this. They call it Viacap, and it's a capsule and capsule delivery technology. So the there's an inner capsule. It's hypromelose capsule, which houses the probiotic, and it's inside an outer capsule that contains the prebiotic formula. Prebiotic meaning it's it like feeds. those Russian eggs. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. Kind of like those. those what are those called? Those dolls, Russian dolls. Uh-huh. Yes. So I'm assuming that it's designed that like your your stomach acid eats away at one layer, but not Correct. the other, and then that way it gets further. Correct. In, okay. So th- through testing, and they can show you can ask them for this testing. The back the live bacteria gets to the target sites at 50 times the rate of the industry standard. Wow, 50 times? 50 times the industry standard. Wow. So you take other probiotics and you're destroying the bacteria in your gut. Basically get nothing out of it. Nothing. Um, or you get some benefit from even dead bacteria. That's not true. You still get some benefit sometimes with dead bacteria because I think it signals live bacteria to change how they behave, which okay. is the theory. So minimal. But this literally delivers intact, alive bacteria to well, this they need to. This no ex- need for refrigeration or anything like that. This explains to me then why, I mean, why we've heard from people that are used to taking a probiotic, why they're like, I just, it feels better. Yep. I don't, you know, and so yep. they're just probably getting more yep. of what they, so they probably had other probiotics that were probably good that they saw a positive effect from. And yep. so that's why they've consistently taken it. Then they switch the seed and they just get more of it. I'm assuming. A hundred percent. That's the main, that's the, re, that's the big uh, besides the live probiotics that they use, which are the you know backed by studies, if you get if it gets destroyed, it really doesn't benefit you at all. And then the ones you have to refrigerate, I never thought of this when I first started taking probiotics. I, I thought, oh, refrigerated refrigerated ones are better because that means they're alive. And they're like, if it needs to stay alive by being refrigerated, what do you think happens as soon as you, yeah, you know, put it in your body? Reaches a high oh, temperature. Yeah. I guess you're right. Unless I'm a snowman, yeah. it's going to be dead. You yeah. know, speaking of companies that we work with, I've been meaning to ask you what's the what's the latest with your cousin and Dynasty. Oh, I'll I read. sent you over a reel. I don't know if you remember. Jerry sent the reel to me first, then I sent it over to you. That oh, this would be a cool Dynasty commercial, um, and you should tell them to make it. I don't know if you sent it over to them. I or did, not. but I want to read to you guys. So I have a friend of mine who um, sent me this message. So a friend of mine heard our heard that we partnered with Dynasty. Looked into it. It's like, oh, wow, this is crazy. I can just go online, create a trust, like yeah, free, free, whatever. Ch- check out what he wrote. He goes, um, he goes, hey, I, I have a pretty good case study for you with respect to Dynasty. And he goes, one of my cousins passed suddenly a few weeks ago. So he was home. He says, I, I was home and I gave the eulogy. Uh, he had a lot of money, but had no direct heirs. And we have no idea where, the, where his will is or where who his lawyer was. So they're like... We have to go to court. We have to figure all this oh, shit out. It's going to take God. a year or more to figure all this stuff out because yeah. that's what happens. It goes to the state. Yep. The state then hears cases, yeah. right? You got to plead all these cases just to win whatever. Yeah, like figure it out to bring it back to the family. This is when you hear those horror stories of like- and who, Okay, so when, in a situation like that, right, yeah. where there's a, a good lump of uh, sum of money, the the you got to hire lawyers- you got to pay for people to do all this. hundred percent. So does that come out of like, so let's play, let's pretend it was, uh, we're all a family 
and Doug's the uncle that dies. It's rich. And yeah. that happened to us naturally. Is it each of us individually that are hiring our own lawyers to go in and do that? Or do we take from Doug's money to pay for a lawyer? No, to, and then like, no. Did, I mean, unless you just go to probate and don't bring a lawyer and then plea your case and then expect to get what you want. Yeah. And then how but much you're like, you're, you're going to want to get a lawyer. Right. And then how much yeah. does the state decides like, Oh, well technically he had this, uh, that's right car thing that's that we right. got to pay for and he needs and like i mean how much do they go and you ever hear the horror stories like some like a guy dies and yeah. his ex and he doesn't have and he ends up a owing will money. doesn't have no doesn't have a will and and then the ex-wife comes well you know he said he would give me this and his other kids are this and then the kids start to fight and what about this and and then it's just it's just a it's a nightmare yeah. it basically even if you have family and kids and everybody gets along what you're leaving them with is a massive headache to deal with after you. Huge stress. Pa uh, huge stress. Yeah. And, and it takes, on average, six months to a year yeah. to figure this crap out. And money is lost during that period of time. And before, again, for people who don't know, <laughs> creating a trust is at least thousands of dollars. Or try doing it on your own by getting the paperwork online. And that's hundreds of dollars, but you still need a lawyer to store it and whatever. Well, Dynasty's free. You go on there and, and that's it. I think the big selling point for me was that, because I would think like, I would go, oh, well, I, I don't have that much money yet. So I don't, you know, I'll wait until I make more money and then do yeah. that. But after hearing him explain like how much more difficult it becomes the, the wealthier you are versus having one set up and then, and then, adding, and then bolstering yeah. and adding as you go Saves along. Saves a lot of the lawyer costs later and, down the road. Right. So then it makes a lot of sense that, hey, even if I'm not at a place yet, I haven't reached this this wealth level that I want to get yeah. to before I could really even give <coughs> any money on. Mm -hmm. Like it's free, set it up so it's all taken care of. And then as you build wealth, uh -huh. it's much easier to bolster it or allocate where it's going to go after you've already created then versus waiting until it's like, oh, now I got all this shit I got to totally, deal with. Yeah. Totally. So, it's so did I tell you guys, um, I was thinking more about the the whole a pound of muscle only burns so many calories and, you know, oh, that annoying uh, data <laughs> shows it doesn't speed <laughs> that up. That really got under your skin. Huh? It did because it's Same. so counter to what every good coach and trainer has experienced with their clients yeah. through things like reverse dieting and strength training where we just see these massive improvements in metabolism. The person can burn more calories, get leaner, easier, the whole thing. Stuff we talk about all the time. One more thing to add to this. We had uh, we had a conversation um, with uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, okay? She's a doctor, an expert on the human body, on metabolism, on muscles. And she explained how accepted current lean body mass tests don't discern the quality of lean body mass. In other words, a pound of muscle is not always a pound of muscle. And the example she used was like looking at a ribeye steak, yeah. which is peppered marbled with, with marbled with fat, fat. versus like a, a filet mignon, which is totally lean. So they don't discern that. So a lot of these studies, when they're looking at lean body mass, you, you know, lean body mass is just stuff that's not fat mass. That's what they can take out. So, it, it, you know, that's why there could be such a big difference. Like, you could take somebody who's got the same lean body mass, but the lean body mass is quality. That is going to require more calories to maintain than one that isn't because it's got it's marbled with fat and it's not as healthy and that kind of stuff. So this may be one of the reasons why the metabolism boost that trainers and coaches experience with their clients doesn't add up or, or should I say doesn't match what they'll what they'll try and pull up the data and say where oh it's only 12 calories per pound and the Trainer's like, look, my client gained three pounds of muscle, yeah. and they're eating six hundred more calories a day, like uh, you yeah, know, we're explain, seeing and getting something leaner. Totally different. Yes. I, I, I mean, there, there's very much so a possibility that, or that could be true, and that could also be a possibility of why it seems so off. But I think the argument, or at least for me, the one that I feel confident I can make is the behavioral and psychological change that comes with adding five pounds of muscle that nobody fucking talks about. Yeah. We always want to break down the physiological side and go, oh, okay, this equals that, but it's like. We, we know that after years and years and years of training all these people, it's like, oh, wow, less of this has been about the biomechanics and the nutrition, and more of this has been about the psychology of it, the behavior around it. And if I can change their behaviors, I can radically change their lives. Mm -hmm. And so there's something to be said about it. Let's pretend that terrible number of, oh, it's 15 calories for every five pounds. And so, oh, you added five pounds, so you only got you know, 300 more calories or whatever, or even less that you're, you're burning. Yeah. But how's your energy level after you've added, you know, if right. you put on five pounds of right. muscle in, in order to do that, 
you've had to eat adequate protein. You know, you've had to strength train properly. Yeah. How you've had to have given yourself. Yeah, you're right. Nice we're, we're, we're trying to separate things out that don't typically come separated. Do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, if you add, if you add, if someone adds five pounds of muscle, there's other things that you can also guarantee. You can't add five pounds of muscle and starve the body of nutrients. You can't add five pounds of muscle and not hit your protein intake. You can't add five pounds of muscle and have not start to build some good recovery processes that go along. You can't buy, but uh, build five pounds of muscle without having somewhat of good programming. Like, Not to mention the extra muscle is antidepressant. It's, that, it's got, you know, pro positive mood uh, chemicals that they release, which could affect things like cravings. Yeah. And other could affect digestion, boosting, could affect uh, mood, effects. can affect. Uh, so there's this whole host of other things that come with a person yeah. who has now disciplined themselves to build five pounds of muscle that aren't measured in a lab. Yeah. That we can't go, oh, that equates to 15 calories. And so if it, and increased neat, like when I know I'm strength training and I'm lifting and I'm a leaner, fitter version of myself, man, I, I walk more upright. So my core is activated, what, maybe what, 30% more of the time of the day because my posture is better and I'm, I'm more energetic. I'm less likely to sit on the couch. Like, you know, how you be walking faster than yes, you do. Yeah. Everything. So it's like you can't just to, yeah. to distill it down to a pound of muscle versus a pound of fat. And what does that do to the metabolism? Is such a no, you're, you're, this frustrating, is, terrible to argument. give you to give you just to back you up. Um, if we <coughs> if we parse out and control everything, okay, uh, artificially sweetened sodas versus regular sodas, everything else being totally controlled. Exactly the same calories, exactly the same activity. Everything's the same. Yes, you'll lose weight because you're cutting calories. And that's what the data shows. Right. But in the real world- It doesn't happen that way. No, 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 no. When people start consuming artificially flavored sodas, we don't see weight loss. Why? Because trying to separate out everything as if humans act like uh, robots, one behavior changes, all other behaviors are identical- Name one behavior that changes that doesn't affect other behaviors. Right. I dare you. <laughs> yeah. Pick one thing. Yeah. Yeah. You can't. Yeah. You absolutely can't. Pick one thing. I get more sunlight. Does that affect other things? Yes. Yep. Or uh, I eat differently. Does that affect other things? Yes, it does. Or I change my frame of reference. Or you know, I change my attitude. Or I start a spiritual practice. Or I mean, who knows? You know, it's just it's, it's why I can't stand the the trainers yeah. that have built a following and have built their business purely around just touting studies because there's so much more to this equation and yeah. to distill it down to some six to eight week lab study to make your case on how people should approach their fitness is just it's stupid it's it's stupid and one it's plus one equals two and it's, it's ignoring so arguments like that it's ignoring so much more uh of the equation and, and arguably other parts of the equation that are far more important than what you're arguing Actually, and all it does yeah. is confuse the average consumer on who's more and these guys are all fighting with each other on oh i can't believe he i can't believe sal said that that's such an over exaggeration this is really what the science says about okay. it's like dude you're missing the point you're missing the point that he's trying to make with that and i just that stuff irritates me because those people are smart they're intelligent they've read they've read the studies maybe they have their degree maybe they have a bunch of national certifications it's like but you are you're hurting the overall population of people that we're trying to help Here, and support. Th there's a reason why a nutrition scientist will not be more successful at getting people to lose weight long term than an experienced coach. The reason is not because they don't know nutrition science; it's because it's a lot more than X's and O's. That's just the fact. And you ask, what do you, what do you, what do you experienced coaches and trainers say when you ask them, "What's it like to?" to train people for 10, 15, or 20 years. What's it like? I'm like oh, sometimes I feel like a therapist. <laughs> Oftentimes yeah. I feel like I'm just guiding people. Other yeah. times I'm just listening to people. It's like way more complex than just exercise, you know, input this food, do that. It's like, if that was, if it was that easy, then we wouldn't have a problem. <laughs> It wouldn't I'm, be challenging. I'm just laughing because I have another like horrible analogy I want to throw in the mix. <laughs> in the mix. <laughs> Are you questioning so the, it that way? This to me just reminds me of I heard somebody once say like when one plus one doesn't actually equal two, right? So yeah. one plus one sometimes that equals one. And when you get two clouds, one plus one, you merge them together, that's one cloud. Mm. There's like plenty of examples <laughs> that in nature all over the place. And yeah. it's like you can't always have that standard as like the only way you see and in, in, in view the that's world. not bad i just think, and, i just thought of that right now yeah you don't no, have two clouds you have one you yeah have one you know and i think that you know the part that i think <laughs> we're, we're always trying to communicate is like 
it's there's lots of value to knowing all those studies, right? I mean, this is what I think. Uh, yeah, you don't want to be like uninformed on yeah, what the data says. Yeah. So I, I mean, one of the things I love about having a conversation with you guys is I know how well read uh, everybody is in this room, especially related to this field. And so, yeah, no, I can I can talk to you about those studies, and I understand what it, but that's just okay so that's good i understand that it's and one then, perspective right here then yeah, i also understand the, the this scope. this person that i'm trying to get to change these behaviors to ultimately lose x amount of pounds and keep it off for the rest of their life and so okay, it's good to have that but it doesn't mean that that's like the answer is oh tell them that and then the problem is solved like no it doesn't work that way yeah, it never has worked that it's way it's so funny i didn't think that i would be able to connect this to any conversation we're having today but somehow it worked out so you're you're with the data when you have a coin right with two sides and yeah. you flip it yeah every time you flip it flip it there's a 50 50 chance it can land on one or the other on heads or tails except right? it lands on its edge well, no. Well, no, not that, but that's another. But let's just say it does. It does. <laughs> We're going to throw a fucking curveball. <laughs> that just ruined my story. Increase the variables. No, oh, no. I so thought that's where you're going. Scientists actually had a machine flip a coin 35,000 something times to see. How close to 50 is it? Is it 50-50? And what they found was <clears throat> the probability that the coin will land on the face that was facing up is slightly higher. Oh, interesting. And the way they decide, the, the way that they explained it was, the heads and tails is not identical when you look at a quarter, right? Like weight wise oh, or whatever. Weight, aerodynamics, mm. how it affects the the, yeah. the the air friction. It's funny. I I I tend to pick heads more often when it's up. When heads is up. Yeah. 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 So that's what it's they good, said. So it's a good strategy. That's yeah. interesting. I, yeah. yeah just so they naturally. and they, so they tested it because data, like back. This is how it connected. Yeah. Data and and probabilities will Let's tell say 50%. you fifty percent. Fifty percent. Like across the board, statistically, no matter what, every time you flip it, fifty percent. The previous flip has no effect on the on the next one. You know, whatever it doesn't matter. And they said, no, actually, uh, whatever's facing up, that in the odds slightly increase that that's the face that's going to be up whenever <laughs> you flip it. Uh, that's interesting because it's something that we just didn't account for. Yeah, the, the the change in air friction and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So now, which is, I mean, I, I love that as like an, an analogy or the, around the conversation we're having because that's just <sighs> it. Is like. There's so many more variables. We don't know everything. Yeah. And I mean, I don't, how many times have you guys had a client who like weight, age, goal, like all these things match. And then like what worked for that person doesn't you even come close to work. That formula doesn't even work. And yet how many times? All, the, all the time. But yet all the math, like, and so if we were to take controls and go, okay, women this age and this weight with this goal, with these things, they would fit. You know, they would fit in a study that is controlled. Like, the, so then yet, so then the outcome should be the same, right? If I apply this to that, if we controlled all these things and they're the same, but why it doesn't, it doesn't. And in fact, more often than not, it doesn't work exactly the same because there's all these other variables that are impossible for us <coughs> to control for that you just have to keep in mind. And so it's good to know the data. It's good to understand that because I think that is what will help you have these conversations. Um, with you know other either other intelligent peers or being able to explain to a client but getting a client to implement that and fundamentally change that's really what all of our goal is supposed to mm -hmm. be it's supposed to be to help these people not prove that i'm smarter than the other guy who's trying to sell you training right you know? just like the, so the, uh, you know just like the studies on food there was another study that came out showing that the consumption of sugar is the is related to all these negative things uh but what they forget to 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 control for is that sugar is often an ingredient that's added to foods to increase their palatability so people eat more so whenever you're looking at high sugar intake you're also <coughs> typically looking at people who eat more food mm -hmm. or when you see high sodium intake it's typically people who eat more food or people who have high fat intake typically people because those three things are are you know, the, how you make something palatable. What does that say, Doug? So I was listening to your coin flipping reasoning, uh, why it would land on the side that was facing up more often. And it didn't make sense to me. However, uh, this is called procession. It means the side that was facing up was, had more time in oh. the air that would account for it. Okay. So I don't uh, think it has to do with wind flow and things. Well, like the that. article I read, they were speculating. Okay. They were well, totally speculating. This makes more sense to me. Interesting.
Yeah, that does make okay. more sense. So you're saying there's no air friction when you, the, when you spin it there? Well, there is, but no, how would that determine which side? You know what I'm yeah. saying? Right, right, right. right. Mm-hmm. That makes more sense. It's it's already facing up it does. A, for a longer period of time than the other way, right? So it has a, a, a slight chance to land up there. I'll tell you something else that my mind was blown. And you guys, I don't know if you know this or not, but so we're into like the Halloween uh, yeah. time. And so, you know, obviously the movie Halloween yeah. and, and Michael Myers. Yeah. Okay, do you know like where they came up with that mask and how that all went of down? Of course, it's William Shatner. Okay, so you knew, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a William it's Shatner a William mask. Shatner death mask that was in uh, Star Trek. Yeah, and then he he had the actor put it on, and they were so freaked out because it was like so lifeless looking and everything. Uh-huh. They're like, "Oh, we're gonna use this." So it's like based off William Shatner's face. Yeah, I did know that. Oh, anyway. uh, I didn't know that. Uh-huh. I think I remember seeing something around those. So okay. So did they ever use it in Star Trek? I think so. I think it was in an episode. It was an episode. Yeah, yeah. see, look. It is, now, when you look at it, can't you see that it's William Shatner? <laughs> yeah, I can't. Yeah, exactly. Now I'm like looking at it, and it's never going to be the same. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, in fact, it's so funny you just said that. I okay, just, so, but. No, I was just going to say, I just saw a, a mashup of old Star Trek clips. Yeah. God, they're funny. Yeah. They're so funny. So my, my, step, my, step, yeah. my, my stepdad was a massive Star Trek fan, so I watched it as a kid growing up for sure. So, okay, so. That was made to shoot a scene where he is dying or dead. Is that what? I don't know. Is that, so yeah, I'm, I'm more to... curious about the story. Like, how did it, how did that come about? Like, they made this uh, mask. A Captain Kirk death mask. Okay, here we Sorry, go. Sorry, just... that's all right, Doug. Go ahead and scroll down and find out what's what's happening there. Uh, let's see here. That's interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. a cool. That's a cool fun fact that I bet a lot of people have no idea. Yeah. So did you, did you watch it with your kids? No, no, no. That's way okay. too scary. I know. Yeah. I was going to say, what are you doing? <laughs> you <I'm> was just traumatizing. <laughs> no, I, you know what I did watch was uh, Super Troopers, though. And I oh, was like, fuck. what was I thinking yeah, with dude. that one? But it was like I had to fast forward some parts. Hilarious movie. Though. I watched Old School with my 13-year-old daughter completely forgetting that there were some definite parts in there she should not be watching. We got to like the... <laughs> It was like the the oil wrestling part, and the, ch- the chicks are taking their top. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I I, I, I wonder where. So it's so funny because I had uh, I have family where my uncle and, and aunt were like really strict with like the type of movies the kids. I remember the kids couldn't even watch like radar movies until they were over 18. Like she, they were mm. really strict about that. And so I, I've always I thought that was kind of crazy. I I'm not and I'm not where you guys are at. So I'm like, where when will I? watch a movie with my son that and like and what kind of inappropriate like am i gonna let him watch like lots of foul language first or uh, sex scenes first or like yeah, what I think, would I think what the would sex stuff is the the, the 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 i don't know the more most concerning yeah now, okay now typically okay, goes now, bad do you, language do you guys, okay let me this is funny because i've thought about this and i i, I feel violence kinda, for me i'm like ah, but so courtney okay. is like it problem. goes bad I'm language violence uh, I go violence, and bad sex. language, and is, then is, sex. Is, oh, okay, yeah. sex is the worst for both of you. Yeah. Now, okay, so this is, I thought about this, and I, I think naturally I've kind of fallen into this too, but then I asked myself why, okay? Is that because it's more uncomfortable for me with my child probably to watch a sex scene, more so than it really is like, they probably have already walked in on well, you guys you having put, sex before. Put so they an know that image in there that their their innocent little brain is like I'm not sure no, they're no, ready no, no. for. It. By the, listen, violence. By the way, God, that's such a broad category because yeah. there's like violence, then there's like gore, then there's like disturbing violence. Like, come on, it could be so bad that it's be- like the kids yeah. feeling is going to be traumatized. Like I know people wouldn't show Star Wars that are like young, like four or five year old. I'm like, dude, I'd. Start both kids with like two, you know, I don't care. But like that, <laughs> that's, not, that's not violence, it's lasers. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> but like yeah. some people have a problem with that. You, you will. Oh no, definitely. I'll tell you what, you will 100 percent pick a movie from your childhood. Every dad does this. You forget what's in the movie. Yeah, yeah. I did this with gremlins. My kids were <laughs> six and seven, maybe. And I'm like, oh, Gremlin! This was was it PG? That oh, yeah. scared me as a kid, bro. So I, I, I know that on. I know I wouldn't do that because I one was well, for some reason I was scared. When First of all, PG like, meant something different in the '80s. That's yeah. that's 100 percent, dude. <laughs> Way different. Yeah, I put it on and it's like my kids got traumatized. I turned it off. I'm like, oh, geez, so you think? Okay, so you think sex is the ultimate weight for them? Then it goes gore. Then it would you say it depends, right? Because nudity isn't course, the same. But I mean, for conversation reasons, yeah. you know, like we can get into the yeah, nuance of it. But I mean, so like. Yeah, there's disturbing violence yeah. and gore that is up there with like with sex. I would say. Where are you at with this, Doug? You have a teenage daughter. I go sex and then like um, bad language and then gore. That's kind of my total. Mm. Oh really? So I'd start with uh, so order that I would allow it. Yeah. Be, uh, bad language. Yeah. Um, 
gore. Uh, I mean, it depends on the, the kind of gore, but if yeah. it's like campy gore, maybe let that. I, I feel sex is probably right. the most forbidden. Yeah. Just simply because I don't think kids should be exposed to that. Yeah. Personally. I know. I know. Yeah. Although, I mean, I mean, it, the violence is interesting, right? Have you seen video games now? Holy shit. Well, that's it. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, I've I've definitely kind of opened that window. <laughs> did you guys get traumatized by any movies when you were a kid? I, I did. I remember my, my, I don't remember what movie. I don't even remember what the movie was. I was a little kid. I was supposed to be in bed. I snuck out, was watching TV behind the couch with my, with my parents, and a guy lost a hand. Uh, and yeah. I just started crying. And my parents turned around and I was there. Yes, yeah, scary. I still movie. remember the. So scene. that's so to me, scary movies were 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 like more impactful on me as a kid. Like when I think back that's of like, you're a scaredy cat. like, well, that's I think it's caused because of that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was traumatized. So I probably saw it too I'm little. Traumatized by Exorcist, and then I didn't want nothing to do with any of that. Poltergeist was like one of the ones uh, I've ever yeah. seen when I was really really too. little. That one yeah. fucked me up, dude. So I, it's not even that bad. Have you watched it? As a yeah, kid? no, it's <laughs> not. But boy, it was for again, for, and I'm sure that's what my parents thought when it was on in the house or whatever. But. Yeah, I don't have like a memory of like hearing bad language or seeing the the sex scene. Uh, like it was more awkward for me as the kid in the room with my parents. Like when a sex scene came on at all, when and my parents were in the room, I felt as a kid, I felt oh, this is so awkward. <laughs> well, so when I yeah. when I was a kid and a sex scene would come on, this was in the VHS days. My dad would fast forward it, but you kind of see what's going on. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's, you know? sort of how it still That's why is. it's kind of funny to me. <laughs> I was like, dude, that I was trying to fast forward, but then if you go too far, you got to come back. And I kept like, <laughs> see, the, the naked bodies are still there <laughs> like, doing <laughs> things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, how do I explain this to my 10 year old, yeah, dude? Just, you know, it's like, oh, this is awful. That's, and then you got to think that at that age, they're already savvy enough to be like, dad, that's this. Or I, you know, like, don't you feel like that? Yeah. I mean, your 13 year old daughter, I, your 12 year old son, like, they're going to know. I'm messed up my kid my oldest because he was older and he was getting into like anime and then i put on uh god i can't remember the name of it damn it it's this it's a it's a po it's a popular anime where like there's these giants that attack this these villages and i can't remember the name of it attack on titan attack on titan and the first episode it's kind of cool a little scary they look kind of eerie they have these weird smiles on their faces and we're watching it together and then the big giant picks up a woman and then they show in detail, he bites her in half. Eats her. And my son went like this. My oldest went like this. And he covered his own eyes. He covered his own eyes. And I was like, my oh, heart. No. You're like, oops. Oh, I broke oh, my I heart. Messed up. Oh, what have I done? Yeah. What have I done? And then I did it again on another one. We were watching the Animatrix, which is the animated anime, you know? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. And there was a part where one of the robots squ squishes someone's head and their eyeballs pop out. So same thing. He got all scared. Like what am I doing, my kid? So maybe, so maybe the move is, yeah. uh, I don't know, maybe kind of like the the sugar approach I did with Max. Like I, I, so long as like they're not even asking for it or really understand, I'm gonna prolong it, right? Like not introduce it to them. Yeah. So maybe that's the mistake you feel like you made is like you introduced it to them before they're even asking for it. Yeah. Maybe you wait until it's like a conversation. Go, oh, my friend said they saw this. Said yeah. It's a great movie. Uh -huh. And then okay, maybe it's time did, you can sit down with dad. We can watch this. Do you guys are. Do you guys? That's are, the move. Do you guys? I think so. Uh, the like second like, one always gets exposed goes too early yeah it's just the older ones the older yeah. and then you know when you're not looking the older brother is like hey look at this yeah. and i know this do you got yeah. have you guys ever been disturbed <laughs> by a movie as an adult was, it, was there a movie that ever got you when you were like in your 20s or whatever oh yeah uh rob zombie movies oh yeah. go ahead oh, take your pick he'll have eyes yes i was what like, the hell now, why did I even? Why did I even yeah. consume this? I was like, ah, yeah, dude. I remember. <laughs> no, I, I stopped it. I actually was thinking to myself, like, he thought up this, this like, yeah. they were making like, this mutants why? raping people, and I'm like, ah, yeah, dude. <laughs> I can't watch it. I, in my twenties, I, I watched it. And watch I felt it, yeah. like I turned <laughs> like, it off. Like this isn't entertaining. No, no. there's no, too much other good sick. stuff in, in TV. Adam gets disturbed by like, like yeah, it's Casper. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my son actually had Casper on the other day. We were watching. Oh, they did put on Netflix. Yeah, I saw yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So we were. I never. One. I don't think I've ever watched it before. He was watching it, and I was like, "Oh, that's cool. That's a good little." It's actually, if you think about it, friendly ghost. It's a dead kid. Yeah, but it's not like Casper's a dead kid. They make him. He became. He's a friendly ghost, right? Yeah, but it's a dead kid though. Katrina still mad at me for making all the like having the, the all the decorations that are like kind of spooky and not like you know fun uh, i was supposed to do like would you Charlie go brown you an actual scary adam yeah. i'm gonna put you on the spot would you do this for the audience would you go to one of those like legit haunted houses with us fuck no what <laughs> oh come on bro go where they like Dude. yeah come at you no hey. way have you ever been to one yeah of course of course I've like tried the real it. ones yeah they used to do them in the mall over here 
And I've been to like one of the, and that was like enough for me. I'm good. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like and skydiving. They, I've did it. Yeah. I have enough to say. Like I know what they're like. <laughs> they always yeah. try to go for the guy right away. Well, yeah, and they know? have like yeah. real people yeah. that chase you. Like, yeah, that's yeah. Not cool. Yeah, that's. I had I'm a guy not, like, that, like a that's... butcher guy like coming at me. Ah! Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, Ooh. so you wouldn't do it now? And and I was freaking out. Film it for some B-roll. No, for no. It, you know, I've already learned enough. With what this, if we get enough business that like a stupid viral video doesn't do anything financially for us? I would not do it. It's like. Yay! We got three million views on me fucking Dude, shitting you're myself. Huge on this TikTok. is so great. How many programs we sell? None. Yeah. <laughs> it's like no. A, that was a, a video of you. Crying. How many people? How many people in the? <laughs> hey, how many people in the social media space actually like do this stuff? Like you know, it's so funny how they think a viral oh, video. They makes just money. sit. Yeah, that's what they're doing right now is planning their next dumb video. It's it's so like there's such a misconception around like social media fame and like a, a legitimate good business. I can't tell you how many people uh, we meet that you think are like super ultra wealthy or successful because they have millions of followers no. on, on Instagram. No. It's like, dude, in fact, it's more rare that somebody has, has figured out social media that well. And then is also a killer, uh, you know, you know, that, business, turn it into business. Yeah. It's like you, you're kind of one or the other, right? You're, there's rarely ever this like business savant. And then they're also this Instagram savant. It's yeah. like, you figured out, you hacked the Instagram really well and doesn't look, translate necessarily look, to millions I have of dollars. A vi I have a viral yeah. clip that is out there. It's the point where people are making t-shirts about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How much revenue did it bring? Nothing. Us? Zero. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. In fact, Jordan you know, Shallow even knew about it. Yeah. He, you know what it got me? Yeah, the journeyman. Yeah. Teased by my co my partners <laughs> over yeah, here. That's the best part. Now they call me the journeyman. That's what I mean. Yeah. That was what you guys would do with me. You're like, hey, let's go do this yeah. like scary thing. Oh, yeah, I want it viral. so bad. Oh, it's I like then I would be this, you know, shitting yourself meme for like the next like 10 years. Just what I want. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. No, thank you, dude. It could work. All right. So today's shout out is a guy by the name of Christopher Maznaritz. Um, his page is Scandinavian dot Astartes. He just won a strongman competition. He used um, maps old time to train and he's legit. I don't understand how someone can be this strong. No, it actually literally doesn't make any sense. Oh, like look at his circus hack. presses. Look at his, uh, old, old, his hack squat, Bro, his hack squat, barbell like. hack squat, 710 pounds raw. Yeah. No belt, nothing. Now he's a big guy. Yeah. Like I don't tall, care how big, big you are. Though. But I looking at him, I would not he he, he just unconventional strength wise. I mean, I've never seen something like that. I can't I can't make any sense of it. He yeah. does just insane stuff. Go on his page, check it out if you like to be impressed by the human body. Yeah. Um I honest to God, I'm not just saying this. I haven't been this impressed in a long time because of the the way he's doing some of these lifts. It's just just crazy. Yeah, he's a champion. Go give him a fall. Grass-fed meat, it's healthier for you. Better, better fatty acid profile. It's a little bit leaner. The problem is it's a little bit more expensive. It can be hard to find. Well, there's a company called ButcherBox that delivers grass-fed meat to your door, but that's not just that's not it. There's also heritage pork, wild-caught fish, and more. This company removes the middleman, delivers it to your door so you can eat your protein and be healthy. Go check them out. Go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump. And if you go to that link, you'll get a free turkey and twenty dollars off your first box. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Douglas from Malaysia. Douglas, what's up, man? How can we help you? Hi. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I've come to a point uh, in my hypertrophy program where I believe the risk of lifting heavier will outgain the rewards. So, like tendonitis and you know pain in joints, uh, kind of you know like loss. Uh, 38 years old, 38 on just gone 38 on Monday, five for eight, 35, you know, th uh, 83 kg, 17 to 15% body fat and put on seven kg of muscle in the last year. Uh, I want to keep on making progress without risking injuries. Yeah. Good. That's so I'm just good question. So this, this, at some point, um, people will hit this this uh, roadblock, right? You, you've been training for a while. Strength is a great metric to measure, to chase. Um, but after a certain point, I mean, you can't keep getting stronger, right? That's number one. Number two, uh, when you start to get to a certain point, little breakdowns in technique, even the smallest breakdowns can make exercises a, a, a bit more da dangerous than they did before when they were maybe lighter, lifting lighter. Um, so yeah. the, the question you're asking is actually one that I think all of us in this room 
encountered uh, ourselves. Now, there's a lot of different ways to challenge the body. One of them is with heavier weight. The other ones are challenging things Tempo. like ranges of motion, slowing down the form. Uh, one of my favorites is doing exercises that you're not proficient in or those exercises that you haven't practiced in a while. That's an excellent one, right? So let's say you always do bilateral uh, exercises for your low body. Doing an entire 12-week cycle of unilateral exercises would be a, a great version, right? Um, so there's a lot of different ways you can challenge and stress and progress the body. Adding weight to the bar is just one of them. And at this point, uh, you know, based off of what you're saying, if you're noticing going heavier, you're not the the rewards don't uh, aren't the, don't give you the payback worth the risks. Then any of the ones that I mentioned would be great ways to to continue to progress. Yeah, give me an idea what uh, your training kind of regimen looks like right now. What do you? How, how many days a week are you training? Do you run a full body, a split? Kind of give me an idea what what the lifting looks like. So so it's, it's three days three days a week. Uh, uh, okay, kind of five sets of compound. So it's five sets of compound lifts that range from you know twelve reps down to uh, down to six reps. Uh, so week, so week one, two, and three be twelve. You know, twelve, ten, ten, eight reps. Uh, week three, four, and five. So week four, five, and six would be ten, <laughs> eight, eight, six, four reps. Uh, and it'll be, uh, yeah, it'll be, it'll be split. It won't be a single body part. It'll be obviously legs on one day and then split on day two and day three. Okay. So are you? Uh, how many times a week are you hitting a, a, a muscle group? Are you hitting it once or twice? Uh, probably about twice. Twice. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the idea of, and it sounds like too, you have kind of a traditional bodybuilding type of a split or routine, uh, running something like maps performance, I think would be phenomenal for someone like you. There's probably going to be some exercises in there that you're not familiar with, or you don't do a lot, uh, getting really good at the Z press or a matrix lunge or Arnold press, like, there's just exercises in there that don't fall into the category of like your the normal you know barbell lifts, and doing what Sal said is just getting really proficient at those. Plus, you're also going to address uh, mobility, so and more multiplanar movements, which is something that's also going to support the joint. So, uh, are you, have you ran any of our programs before? I haven't read any of your programs. I've only been introduced uh, to your podcast six months ago by uh, by my partner who calls you. Uh, Calls you podcast gods for, for <laughs> fitness. Smart guy, very smart guy. Listen to that guy. Yeah, I, I. So I'm gonna have Doug, unless the guys disagree. I, I say uh, mass performance is yeah. a direction that I would point you in. You, so, you, how long have you been working out for? But and it says you play rugby as well. Yeah. So you, how long have yeah. you been lifting for? Uh, since since pretty much university. So about 18, 18 years. Oh yeah. oh yeah. You know what also would be good? Old time. Mm -hmm. I, that would be the furthest yeah, either away. One those, either one of those would be great. Old, yeah, old time strength would be the furthest away from probably. I mean, with 18 years of lifting experience, you've probably done a lot. Yeah. Uh, old time is going to. You're, there, I guarantee there's going to be lots of exercises that you've done that you've never done that are in that program, um, and it's going to strengthen your body in ways that you probably never have, and it's probably going to highlight some weaknesses. That I would, you know, based on the sport that you play. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you train and practice regularly, you know, you don't need necessarily to train for conditioning because you're probably playing rugby. I think uh, old time would even be a good option. Yeah. I mean, and rugby is such an explosive sport too. And so like, and you're 38 years old and it's kind of at that point where you got to start looking at longevity as, as part of that uh, uh, focal point now. And so to, to be able to kind of restore and, and recover is going to be a little bit of a higher priority for you <clears throat> than just like maintaining this like crazy explosive strength. You already have the crazy explosive strength. I'm going to assume um, uh, to, to maybe dive in a little bit more into the mobility. That's why Adam's suggestion with, uh, mass performance has that kind of built in on those days in between. And I think once you get into the rhythm of that, you're going to see what, uh, how your body responds to that and how, uh, your joints are just going to really thrive and benefit. From yeah. That. Douglas, to give you an example, um, you know, think of like, a think of a race car, a, let's say, a, a, you have a muscle car, lots of horsepower. And uh, somebody might say, hey, I want to make it faster. I'm going to add more horsepower. But upon further examination, they notice the wheels spin when you try to take off. You're not getting good traction. Well, somebody who really understands how to make that car faster wouldn't spend any time on trying to make a, a more powerful engine. 
they try to figure out how to improve the timing and, and, the, and the grip of the tires and sticking the power to the road. That would make the car much faster. More horsepower at that point becomes a liability. Um, so at, your, at this stage of your lifting career, you know, improving range of motion, control, mobility, they are ways of getting stronger. They definitely are. And you'll notice improvements on the field and off the field, even though the bar doesn't have any more weight on it. Uh, like, you know, maybe in the past where you had to add weight to the bar. At this point, it's about control, stability, mobility, and learning new skills in the weight room. You know, that's why I said old time. MAPS Old Time Strength is a program that's based off of the way lifters trained in the bronze era, right? So it's like the, the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. And there's exercises and movements in there nobody does anymore. So you take a, an experienced lifter like yourself, Mm -hmm. you try a program like that, you're going to feel like a beginner, but you're also going to get those beginner gains. You're going to get that, that central nervous system adaptation. You're going to get that coordination that's going to build the skill uh, uh, in, in, of the muscles working together in new ways. And then when you go back to your old traditional lifts, you know, I'm, I'm getting so many messages from yeah. people who are trying pro our program uh, old time. And then they're, they're like, man, I didn't deadlift like traditionally, uh, or barbell squat traditionally for the entirety of the program, for the most part, I went back to my traditional lifts. I'm stronger. Yeah, it fills so many gaps. That's right. Yeah. And it's not because they were lifting heavier with those lifts, but rather they were bolstering parts of their body. They didn't even know needed bolstering. So Douglas, how, how often are you playing rugby right now? Uh, at the moment, it's, uh, it's the off season at the moment. Oh, okay, okay, cool. So the uh, season's probably going to start in, in January. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, per time. personally, I like performance first, then old timey, just because of the emphasis on the mobility stuff. And I also think that you can take the mobility days and apply that to other programs like, like old timey or other things that we have. And I just think there's a lot of value in doing that. I agree with the, the, what you're going to get from old timey. I just think I would take you through performance first and then old timey. Okay. So what, so what I'm hearing is there's, you can get different rewards instead of just like adding adding oh, yeah. kgs yeah. On, onto the belt onto the the bar. There's going to be uh, different rewards in terms of range of motion, mobility, hitting yep. other muscles. Hundred percent. You get if you get a. Let me give you an example. Right. Let's say you took the average man who could squat 150 pounds. You get him to add 50 pounds to his squat uh, because he's never worked out before he's going to notice significant improvements in his athletic performance. You get someone who's been lifting for years and years and years and years, 18 years, and they add 50 pounds. To the First of all, adding 50 pounds to the squat after 18 years of lifting is going to be almost impossible. Almost yeah, impossible. Think of all of the things that would be necessary to make that happen and all the compromises that would have to happen as a result. But even if you were able to add 50 pounds to somebody's squat after 18 years of lifting – the translation would not be the same in performance as improving control and stability or identifying areas where there's weak links. So it's, it's, it, you're, you're in a different situation. We often don't talk to people like you when we're talking generally, because the average person is not lifted for 18 years consistently. The average yeah. person, if the, if we're lucky has been lifting for six months or a year consistently, oftentimes they're just getting started back up. So it's a different conversation altogether. So someone like you, I mean, if you were to hire me, I'm not putting you, unless your programming's terrible and your 18 years of lifting was the worst that's, you know, that I've ever seen, I wouldn't focus on getting you as strong as possible at lifts that you've been doing for 18 years. I would be looking at stuff that you haven't been doing. I would be trying to identify, you know, movement issues and mobility. And that's where I know you're going to get the most bang for your buck. All right. So, so try something like old time or performance and then come back to, yeah. to the original yeah. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes. Because we're disagreeing, I'll give you both programs since I think one is better than the other to start with, <laughs> and then you can choose from there, and then you know, let us know what you think. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. You got it, man. All right. Thanks for calling in. Cheers. Yeah. This this is not common because most people don't train that long, that consistently. Yeah. But you know, you look at uh, uh, eighteen years. Yeah. That's a long time. I mean, look, I I ran to this I, th at one point. Uh, this year, I was like, oh, I wonder if I could, you know, keep pushing my deadlift past a certain point. In every five pounds, which is hard to add to my lift, one of my favorite lifts, 
it was just so much had to go into it. I had to compromise so many other lifts. Mm -hmm. I would notice if I was off a little bit, oh, I'd hurt for like a whole week. And I'm like, okay, if I add 20 pounds to my deadlift, what am I going to get from it? I'm not going to gain a tons of muscle. I'm not going to, it's just a number at this point. Um, it's better if I work on things I don't normally work on. That's where I'm going to get the most bang for my buck. But you get someone who's just only been lifting for a year. Yeah, let's get you stronger. Let's just get you stronger. That's where you're going to get the most results. Yeah, that's where the focus is. Yeah, and it builds the base. He's obviously built his base already. So now it's really, it's about preserving that, but also to challenging it in new ways that the body can benefit from. And that the only way to do that is to, to uh, work on exercises and things that uh, you're completely unfamiliar with. So which way you go, Justin? You're the tiebreaker. Yeah, I I go performance first, and yeah. and that's just because I a I have a, I have a I have an inclination that he hasn't really worked on mobility yet. The, you know what though? Here's <laughs> the thing: too. we should have said don't to skip phase one. In that case, phase one is very go traditional. straight to phase two. Yeah, go okay. straight to phase two. I can agree with that. He's probably done a lot of that style of training sure. right out the gates. Phase two would be different, likely. Right? Yeah. Our next caller is Jeremy from Ohio. Jeremy, what's happening? How can we help? Hey, good afternoon, guys. How are you guys doing today? Good, good, good. man. How's it going? <laughs> hey, hey uh, apologies up front. Uh, I've only ever listened to your podcast. I really have no idea how these Q&As play out on video. A um, little bit nervous here, but uh, so just please bear with me that. Uh, first off, I wanted to say congratulations. Uh, I think the four of you really have something special here. Um but I also believe it is very important for you to be guests on other podcasts, too, to help spread some of your information and knowledge out. Uh, had I not heard Sal on uh, Max Lugavere back, I think it was May in 21, uh, I'd still be stuck in that, that breakdown recovery cycle that you guys talk about so much there. Uh, so after listening uh, for several months, I did uh, 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 get anabolic, and I was really blown away by the results. I ran that through twice. Um, it's as if, uh, I was achieving newbie gains, even yeah. though I've been lifting awesome, for 12 man. years. Love that. Yeah, it says yeah, here you get, you get, did 50 pounds to your bench, 40, wow. to, your, yeah. 40 yeah. to your squat and 30 to your deadlift. Wow. Yeah. Damn, I, I was pretty amazed by the results with that. I was really happy with uh, my progress there. Um, so at the risk of, uh, possibly stalling some of that gains, you know, my, uh, email had multiple questions on it, but the crux of it was, uh, what are the real realistic expectations for building muscle over the age of 50, um, especially if there is a reluctance um, to add significant number of calories to the diet? Well, ca you know, if you're if the calories part makes it a little bit more challenging, I'm assuming you want to stay lean while you build. Is that why you're doing that? Yeah, I mean, to this point, I've basically had a recomposition. Um, so I was never I've always been a thin guy. Um, and uh, but I've noticed that the amount of muscle has increased, even though my weight has not increased. Um, so I didn't know how much further that could continue without having to add thousands of calories a week. You know, I mean, maybe I'd be happy doing, you know, two to 300 every now and then, or maybe on just the days I lift, but to do that consistently, I'd, I'm a little nervous about, uh, doing, uh, that great of a, uh, an increase. Yeah. You don't have to go crazy with a calorie surplus, but a surplus, which just means, more calories than is required to maintain is necessary uh, for the muscle building process. Now, if you have a good strong signal to build muscle, you don't need a ton of calories. However, I will say this, a calorie surplus by itself, and I'm careful when I say this because people can take this too far, but a calorie surplus by itself can be anabolic, okay? Especially when your body's getting stronger, you know? A lot of the strength gains that you'll get will be central nervous system adaptation, muscles moving better together. By the way, that's great. There's nothing, you're literally stronger. And then some of it comes from increasing contractile tissue and the muscle fibers. You will limit that by not fueling yourself with more calories, but you don't need a ton. You don't need a ton. 500 calories above your maintenance, which, you know, if you're tracking and you know what you eat on a regular basis, you could just add an extra meal. And just watch, watch yourself, watch your physique. I don't think you'll gain tons of body. I don't know how lean you are. It depends a lot also on how lean you are. Like if you're in single digit body fat no, percentage, no, I, you, okay. Yeah. If you, I, it's a, if, you know, I'm 170 pounds. I, if I had to guess, I'd say somewhere probably 15, 18% somewhere oh, around there. You're fine. Yeah. 500 calorie de uh, surplus with good strength training routine you're, you're probably not going to gain any body fat. Um, you'll, you'll gain muscle. Especially you know, if we do, I think it'd be good for you to switch. Sounds like you've gone through anabolic twice. 
And so if we did another program that is a novel stimulus, yeah. then you're also sending a signal to get those like newbie gains again. And any sort of additional calories that we consume should get prioritized over to building muscle. So that would be my suggestion is to, you know, based off your goals, if we want to keep building muscle is to switch to another MAPS program. And I don't know, have you looked through some of them to see? Because we could go a lot of different directions with you. Yeah, I was thinking, I was actually looking, considering I already have performance and I have uh, Mass 15, my wife and I, you know, she does, uh, I got her involved too, thanks to you guys and my son too. So my son's in college so and bad. he's doing anabolic right now. So, uh, but I was looking at um, symmetry possibly, mainly because I've noticed some imbalance in my right and left side. So, and oddly, it's my, my non-dominant side is stronger than my dominant side, which is very weird. Which, mm. which the both, both arm and leg or just like? Uh, mainly just in the arms, mainly in the arm. I noticed definitely uh, a, 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 a difference in mass on my left, uh, for instance, biceps and triceps compared to uh, the right. So you mean strength? Is it strength or just size? Because both. This, both. Wow. Both. Okay. That's huh. interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some, sometimes it has to do with uh, the sport someone played or something in yeah. the past or um, but that's, yeah, that's interesting. I, uh, symmetry will balance. That I love, though. I love symmetry. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a great, it's a great that's one a, to focus on. I think it's a great idea. I think symmetry, and then you could bounce back to like performance and go back into the kind of yep. uh, the, the three in a row that we kind of wrote in that in, uh, originally after that, I think uh strong or power lift would be good, uh, as well for someone like you definitely consider that. So going back to the question, I mean, realistically, how much uh, muscle can someone expect to build after the age of 50? Is that a realistic goal to be able to, uh, yeah. to, to increase? Oh, you, you can build muscle after at any age. Uh, it's more determinant on how long you've been training already. Like if you've been training for years and years and years, it gets much more difficult to, you know, to build muscle. It also is, you know, based off of what you were doing before versus what you were doing now. If I take somebody who's been working out a long time, but their diet, their sleep, and their workout programming wasn't so great. We can make huge changes in muscle. If I take someone who's been training for a long time and doing a lot of things right, it gets much more, uh, much more challenging. So that's 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 what will determine whether or not we're going to see big gains or, or smaller gains. Also, how you are health wise too, right? So, yeah. where have you done like a blood panel? Do you yeah, know where your hormones. hormone levels are? Like where you? That's no, funny you mentioned. I actually just got the, this in the mail from Cabral, the uh, sensitivity test. Oh, so cool. I'm okay. starting that stuff, but. Um, uh, you know, uh, no, I have not. My wife and my my son have done more of that. I I really have just been along for the ride as far as that's concerned. I just uh, follow the same diets they do, and you know, we have a, a pretty uh, uh, unconventional diet. You know, we stick to uh, uh, meat based and plant forward more or less. Okay, and you're hitting your protein targets, then I'm assuming. Say again. You're hitting your protein targets, I'm assuming. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I I mean because you're afraid of adding more calories uh i would say you probably got a, 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 some good muscle there that you could gain by by pushing the calories up about 500 if you haven't done that yet that'll that'll yield you some pretty nice results mm -hmm. especially if you're eating good whole foods like that yep. i think you're going to be just fine bumping the calories like that and then i do i do recommend getting you know the blood work and, and testing like that at, at your age right now that's the the areas that i'd want you if you were a client of mine just to see if there's areas that we can optimize there. If you do have any sort of food intolerances, humming, yeah. if your hormone levels are, are lower, we could optimize that. So a lot of those things could play a big role in you continuing to see, you know, gains through it past your fifties and stuff too. So I think that you're already heading down the right path with that. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. So, I mean, if, if, if I'm primarily doing uh, total body workouts, you know, three days a week, um, obviously there's, there's a tremendous amount of stimulus taking place. Um, so when it comes to the actual growth of muscle, um, what, what takes priority? Is it, is it the loudest stimulus? Is it the genetics? Is there something I'm missing? It's a, it's, it's very complex interplay between a lot of different factors. Uh, genetics obviously is one of them. Uh, training stimulus is the other one. Stress. Right dose. Yeah. yeah. Recovery. Mm -hmm. Your body's like overall stress levels, hormone signals. It's a beautiful dance. It's not yeah. as straightforward as one thing or the yeah. other. It really is. It's like, and which is why, you know, it's why all of us have jobs, right? If it was that easy, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if it was that easy to where it was just like, hey, plug and play and everybody should build or not, right? I think it's, you know, you're, you're as a trainer, the thing you're trying to help out the client with always is to figure out, you know, what, where are we not, where are we missing? Are you, are you have a lot of stress in the life right now? Are our hormone levels not optimized? Are we, 
overtraining the body? Are we understimulating? Are we are we feeding the body deficient. enough? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a very delicate dance of, of all these things, and so. I mean, I think you're heading down the right path. I think the fact that you're seeing the gains you are, yeah. you're. I mean, you're, that mean that yeah, that there's, tells there's more potential there. The fact sure. that you've recently put that much weight on the bar and those big lifts tells me, or or hints very strongly that there's some there's some muscle you can put on your body at, at your age. I mean, you you gained 50 pounds on your bench press. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, you know, yeah, your relatively recently. That. Yeah. yeah, so that's that's huge. You got to feed it. You do you take supplements? Do you take creatine? I do. I do creatine. I do uh, uh, an amino powder, perfect aminos, um, and then as well as the d different nutraceuticals. Okay. Yeah, that's it. I was going to say take creatine if you don't, but you already take it. So other than that, I mean, the bumping calories, the change in programming should yield you some measurable muscle gains. Yeah, Jeremy, I'm going to have I'm going to have Doug send map symmetry over to you. Awesome. And, and then uh, after that, the things we consider is maybe stronger power lift, but we'll send over symmetry to get you started on that. And then just keep us posted, uh, posted yeah. how things are going. And then Sal's advice, I think, you know, at least three to 500 calorie boost a day uh, through those whole foods. Don't uh, be afraid of the calories. Don't right? be afraid no, of, no, don't no, be no. afraid of, we could always go back the other way. You know, so, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you, what you're doing right now, you're on the right track. And For I do sure. think there's, there's more in the tank there. Very good. No, I truly appreciate it. I'm just looking to stay as healthy as I can for as long as I can, well into old age. You know, I want to be the 90-year-old that can uh, squat 300 pounds. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like awesome. that. I like that goal. Good Good deal. All right. Very good. All right. All right thanks, Jeremy. Jeremy. All right. Take care. You want to hear something weird? He reminded me of a client who, so when he brought that up, that's why I was asking him about, his, you know, his asymmetry, how I'm non-dominant. Oh. Uh, yeah. This is, I've only had this one time and it's probably super rare. I had a client who was weaker on the side that had significantly more hypertrophy. Mm. So they had a, a, a they had a much more. Uh, uh, I mean, it was you could see it, it was much, size wise. It was big, muscle yeah. size wise. It was significant visual visually. You could see more hypertrophy uh -huh. on one side of the body of, of their leg. You know, one leg versus the other, and the leg that was bigger was weaker and had less Interesting. stability. Now, here's what it was, because we couldn't figure out what the hell's going on. It was a very strange mystery. We were working with their neurologist. It was an adaptation because they had damaged nerves mm. connecting to that side. So the body mm. tried to adapt by building more, more muscle. Building muscle to How compensate. weird is that? That was the theory, at least. And the body's like so strange, great at right? compensating. Yeah. You know where I've actually seen people have this, uh, where this, the weaker or the what they would consider the weaker side is more dominant? is sometimes in athletes where athletes mm -hmm. have gotten really good at organizing their entire, for example, like a picture, a, like a right-handed pitcher yeah. to throw the ball. It's not like they're just using one no. or two months. They're using all that side yep. yeah. to generate all this force. At the and, right time. Right. Yeah, and so and then when they relaxes. go to do like, let's say a bench press type of exercise, the weaker side, they, they have to be very technical on form. And so yeah. it's getting, it's, it's hitting the muscle, right? Where the other side they can just generate power, and, yeah, they and they're getting a lot of more they don't have the decelerated control. forces exactly. too. That's right. Have to, yeah. So they don't have the harder. same. They don't have. Also, the, sometimes it's not. Uh, it's not as apparent or, or obvious. Like a soccer player, right? Is right. He's got you know kicks with the right more often. Their left leg will have better balance. Yeah, yeah. They, because they balance on the left. Yeah, yeah, anchoring yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. that's the left leg's taking a lot of that. Symmetry was a great call, though. I, I think yeah. that's a great call to yep. send him that way. Our next caller is Ashni Ashnia from the Philippines. Ashnia, how can we help you? Hi guys, good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time. Of course, I'll start by saying thank you. I know that you hear this all the time, but it's just worth repeating after everything you've done in the fitness community. You deserve every bit of success. So please don't stop making content because you're not just changing lives, you're definitely saving lives. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks for saying so, that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to the question. So can you really squat as to grass with heavy loads so for context i completed all three programs from the maps rgb and would want to continue focusing on strength uh, primarily on my squat now i noticed that during phase one of each program i was able to increase weights on my squat significantly but at the same time i was having a little challenge to maintain the same depth now, my goal is to, of course, again, uh, squat as to grass with heavy loads. But the internet says if you want to squat as to grass, uh, I mean, as to grass is not the way to go if you want to squat heavy. 
but I don't actually believe them. That is why I'm coming to your show. I'd like to get some advice. Should I focus on getting strong first or get better with my mobility? Yeah, the internet's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you know, got to be careful out there. Heavy, heavy is all um, relative. It's all relative. Like what, what, okay, heavy for someone might be light for someone else. So heavy is just about uh, the intensity of the load that the load brings to you, and all exercises should be performed with good control, stability, and technique. Okay, so. The, the real question is, can you squat ass to grass with a heavy load, in, right, in the context of, of that particular range of motion, so long as you have good stability, control, and mobility? And the answer is, of course. You can do, if you can control a movement and a range of motion, if you have good stability, if you have good mobility, if you have good control, then you can do it. There's no question about it. And that, that, that goes to any exercise. Now, the, 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 the real question is, is there any benefit to squatting deeper versus squatting less deep, right? Why should I squat lower uh, versus squatting to just parallel? Well, is if with all things being equal, with both of them being under good control, well then yeah, squatting deeper means you're strengthening a deeper range of motion. You are you are strengthening muscles in positions and in lengths that you wouldn't be if you just stopped the range of motion short. Remember, the strength that you gain from an exercise is, to 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 a large extent, limited to the range of motion that you train it in. If I only do curls halfway, I get a little bit of carryover outside that range of motion, but most of the strength is going to be that I gain is going to be in the range of motion that I train. So why would you limit, why would anybody want to limit the strength gains to a certain range of motion? Now, the, the only correct answer to that would be, or the only reason why that would make sense would be that they don't have the mobility. They don't have the control of stability to, to, to go in a deeper range of motion. But then I always, to that, my retort is, we'll see if you can train your mobility and your function so that you can work in those deeper ranges of motion. So uh, aside from specific sports, specific applications, um, there, yeah, there's no validity to, to what the internet says about you know, ask to grass squats. I mean, I would love to put you in our private forum if you're not in there already. I'd love to put you in there. I'm then, already in there. Okay, so then my recommendation would be to load the bar with a very comfortable, lightweight that you feel comfortable controlling and do a really deep squat so I can see your technique. And then if I look at it and I think you have a really, really good squat, uh, then I would encourage you to load the bar uh, with a weight that's challenging for you. But the the question is that because some people can do it, but then they have a massive forward lean and or and or their knees are caving in or they have like a rounded back when they do it. And so or an excessive butt wink so they could get down ass to grass. But why you hear uh, some some of the coaches out there saying that oh, you shouldn't heavy load that is in fear of their poor technique. Back to Sal's point that if you can do it with good control stability and, and range of motion, then absolutely. But uh, I do think it's important that we assess that first before you go do a, a max lift uh, in, a, in a deeper range of motion that you don't usually do. I would never recommend a client do that until I see the technique. Have you ever assessed your squat? Like, what do you think about your squat deep? Why, uh, why do you feel like sometimes you can go to a certain level and other times you can go deeper? Do you notice a difference in the squat? Yeah, when I was running anabolic, I uh, I compared my squat from, I think that was phase one and phase three, I think, the higher reps, but lower, uh, higher reps, but lower uh, weights. Now I can really like uh, squat deeper and I can even pause for a second. But if I'm going to load the bar heavy, I, I only hit parallel. So right now I try to like rec uh, record my last uh session uh yesterday so i was able to load the bar 100 uh it's 60 kilograms just parallel so my aim is to like really hit that parallel and just really comfortably squat I, I, well i guess my point is i really want to challenge my mobility yeah, yeah. Like look, how low can I squat with, have, with heavy loads? Ashnia, you have to compare apples to apples. So a, a, a parallel yeah. squat to a squat that's below parallel, you can't compare it's the a weight. Different exercise. Yeah, yeah, I can't. I can't say mm. that, it's not the same, right? So, so you may be already lifting yeah. heavy deep, 
Right. So when so when you do go mm-hmm. what you consider lighter weight because it's lighter than when you only go parallel. So what yeah. what Sal means by that? So if you let's say you can do a hundred and a hundred twenty pounds uh, just to parallel, but you can do mm-hmm. eighty pounds ass to grass. That, that mm-hmm. eighty pounds ass to grass is you're you are you're lifting heavy there. Yeah, it's a it's a greater range of motion, so you're getting a bigger bang for your buck there. So even though there's less weight on the bar, it doesn't mean you're not lifting heavy weight. It's potentially heavy for you to do eighty pounds ass to grass. Yeah, your, your body doesn't know what weight you're lifting. It it knows tension. Yeah, your body's not registering the weight; it registers the tension. Right, so. Um, look, I'll give you another example. Oh, we have a video right here too. I didn't even well, know we had. If a video. you're doing sixty, if you're doing sixty kilos on a parallel squat, and you want to add weight, here's something else you could do. Instead of adding weight, go a little deeper with the same weight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Challenge mm-hmm. it an inch or two lower, and slowly increase the range of motion with the same weight. You're you're going heavier technically. That's why, yeah, okay. it's a little Makes bit sense. of a a difference of um, uh, goal here in terms of like, are you you trying to get more weight? But get lower. I would focus on getting yeah. lower and then start adding oh, wow. weight. You, know, you you look good. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, there were there were a good. couple there that went as low, but I mean, I would I oh. would go low, go low, and I progressively would, overload your weight back keep up. Your, keep your form about, the same. Don't change your yeah. squat from phase one to phase three. Change the weight in the reps, but keep the weight, keep the the form the same. There's no reason for you to train with a shorter range of motion. Yeah, no, you look yeah. good. I think what's happening is you, you just you you Thank challenge you. you challenge the weight and then you probably get a little nervous and scared to go deeper because it's ha- really heavy. Just lighten it exactly. up. Exactly. Li- yeah, yeah, just lighten it up a little lighten bit. Lighten it up. Lighten it up a little bit a little bit to allow yourself to go that full range of motion and then eventually It just needs time. You yeah. just need time of repetition getting mm-hmm. at that depth. Yeah. Uh, and then you'll you'll notice the same uh, progression that you've how, you've made already uh, at a higher position. How often do you do hip thrust? I don't do hip thrust. Okay, so I think that'll help you. I think what's happening right here is that when you get really really deep in that stretch position, and the glutes have to yeah. really hit you out of the hole, you're a little bit weaker there. You look like you have very strong legs and quads. I'm uh-huh. from your video. At least it looks like it from the video. And the glutes may just be a little bit underdeveloped in comparison to your quads. Uh-huh. I would incorporate some hip thrusts into your training. Yeah. Uh, and try and get really strong in the hip thrust. Some pause and, reps down there at the bottom. And, and see how that carries over and to help you uh, with your barbell back squat. But you, you look good. Yeah, but the, your squat form shouldn't change uh, from phase to phase. The weight is relative to the form and your technique. So don't change your form to lift more weight. Then, then that's not doing you any good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're on yeah. the right track, though. You look. Right. I mean, you're but dang, yeah, your form looked great. Yeah, with the deep she's, ba- she's barefoot too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you look great. Yeah. Great yeah. job. Yeah, you're doing great. I literally think adding some hip thrusts into your routine, you're going to see some great benefit from that. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks for calling in, Ashina. Thank you. Tag us in the forum too, so we can see the progress. I'd like to see how you're doing. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. You have All a good right. one. Hip thrust is like one of those exercises, I will say, that if you recommend someone to do it, they immediately think to themselves, like, does my butt not look good? (laughs) (laughs) Based on your video, I think you should do hip thrust. I mean, I could see that. I could see. uh, No, I see see what you're saying with the technique. Yeah, Yeah, I could see. And if if one of the things that will, I mean, that's why deep squats are so great for the glutes is because when you're down there at the bottom to get you out of that hole. It's in a stretch position. Yeah, it's in a stretch position. They got to fire. And so what's happening is I, I think it's just underdeveloped in comparison to her quads. And she had great quads. I mean, I looked at her legs. You can see she's got strong legs. So I bet if she includes some hip thrust, get if she gets really good at hip thrust and and starts loading that, I bet you'll she'll see great carryover into the squat. Yeah, it's um you know it's interesting because when you're taught when because I know what's going to happen. Some people are going to talk about athletic pursuits and athletes squatting parallel or half squats or quarter squats mm. there is it's different there is, yes there different. is value to shortening the ranges of motion but it's sport specific it's almost always sport specific in that case i um, mean the truth is you know it's funny that it's not talked about very much if you were training like an athlete you actually technically should be squatting on your tippy toes most of the time uh-huh you're, I mean that's another part. I mean most all most all sports do not want you flat on your. Name me a sport where you should ever be heavy on your no. heels. Yeah. Never. 
Yeah. So if you really want a, I was a just great having that conversation with Smitty, not too really, long ago. yeah. What does he think? Would he is he agree? Yeah. Um. To yeah. To some extent. To some say, extent, right? in terms of like building the base, it's basically everything we say about like starting off with building a good base. And yeah. Like, yeah. And glute, but then but then specifics. Yeah. Like you're, you're going to want to end up on balls of your feet and strength in that position because if I'm out on the field, I'm not. If I'm heel driven, I'm dead. Yeah. You know, you're I don't have any movement. Yeah. That's it. That's in any sport. Any sport, you are on. You're on your toes. Like I'm trying to think of a, an example where you wouldn't, or that would be valuable. That's for why you. the sled is so amazing. That's yes. right, because you're you're driving on the toes all the time. A hundred percent. That's why that's so great. So really, for the athletes out there, that I think that if you have a good, decent, already backloaded squat on your heels. Uh, tippy toe squats are a great exercise. That's how they used strong. to squat back in the day. You know that, right? Bronze era squats were always on the toes. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, flat squats didn't happen until later mm -hmm. because they could add more load. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Our next caller is Catherine from Louisiana. Hi, Catherine. How can we help you? Hey, guys. Thanks so much for taking my call. I'm excited to speak with you. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. I'm 34 years old and I'm very new to weightlifting. Um, I had three babies in four years. So from January of 2016 to January of last year, I was either pregnant or breastfeeding. So in January of last year, I finally managed to get my fitness life back on track. And I spent 18 months doing Orange Theory. And I know y'all's thoughts on that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my husband has undergone a remarkable fitness transformation over the last six years, most recently and successfully using your programs. And he was really encouraging me to switch things up to weight training after I kind of hit a plateau um, last summer. And then I'm listening to your episodes and there was one and it just felt like Adam was addressing me directly. I love the social aspect of Orange Theory, but I realized I just wasn't achieving the desired results for the amount of time I was putting in. Um, I was going four times a week and with kids, that's pretty much all of my free time. So on to my question, um, it's kind of all around nutrition. I'm 5'11 and I began anabolic advanced in July of this year. Um, I was 162 pounds I track my macros and I'm currently aiming for 2,300 calories and 160 grams of protein. I completed anabolic advanced and now I'm in week two of aesthetic. And I just noticed that I feel a little bulkier. My shorts fit a little tighter. Um, and then my weight is sitting closer to 165. I'm definitely seeing strength gains though. And I, I feel fantastic. Um, my gut health, my sleep, like I feel really good, but the scale is playing mind games with me. And I'm just uncertain if I'm truly noticing any changes in the mirror. I know you say to expect this. I've heard you say it a hundred times, but I'm just curious, what should I be doing over the coming months? Um, I know you'd say three weeks of bulking, then one week of cutting. If I'm trying to gain muscle, vice versa, if I'm trying to lose fat, and I'm just not sure what phase I'm at at this point. Is 2,300 calories too much? Is that bulking for me? I really don't know. I, Kath, this is easy. I, yeah, I'm going to speak directly to you again. You're doing a great job. Yeah. You're doing a good job right now. I got easy advice for you. Throw your scale okay. away. Yeah, yeah, take yeah, your yeah, stop, yeah. stop weighing yourself. Yeah, I, I, you're five doing eleven. Great. You're doing great. If, first off, you, you look lean. Okay, I see. I can see you on on camera. Five eleven, one sixty five. You're getting stronger. So if you're gaining a little bit of weight on the scale, which it looks like you gained what three four pounds. Is that was that we gained three pounds? Right. Okay. Correct. So, okay. So three pounds. So three pounds on the scale. You're noticing significant strength gains with the strength training. You just started strength training relatively recently. Before that, you did Orange Theory. I right. wouldn't be surprised if you lost body fat at the same time. Yep. The only way to really know that would be with consistent body fat uh, percentage testing. The scale is a terrible yeah. metric on its own, and it does play mind games with you. Like you said, you're looking in the mirror, and you're questioning whether or not you're actually seeing what you're seeing and is you know what's happening here. As far as clothes are concerned, especially women's clothes, men's clothes are like this as well, but women's clothes are not designed. Yeah. For athletic women at all. Uh, yeah. If you go from orange Especially five eleven women. Yeah, no. If so you're, you're tall. If you're going if you're going orange theory, which is basically just cardio, if you're doing a bunch of cardio, 
Then you start lifting, following our programs in particular. Yeah, your shorts are going to feel tighter because your butt grew. Yep. Your hamstrings your probably quads, yep. developed. Your 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 body fat sits lower on the body. Muscle kind of sits higher. So things are going to start feeling a little different. You're going to notice, you know, maybe a little tightness around the shoulder. Well, your posture is probably different. A little bit more developed in, in the in the arms. Probably a little more sculpted looking. But I wouldn't be surprised if you're getting comments from people you haven't seen. Yeah, in a while. I want to know what your husband thinks. What does he say? Okay. He swears he see, he's seen major differences. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So you need Listen to look. Okay. Husband. Now Try. don't, 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 don't tell him. Cause I know, I know how men are. We get, we don't, you know, if we hear one thing, it's like, <laughs> but I, he's right. He is right. <laughs> if he's, he's saying he's that, if, if he's saying that and you're getting stronger. You're doing great. Yeah. You're, you're, he's right. You're num the numbers that you're, and I'm assuming that 2200, 2200 calories. I'm assuming that is an effort of you to increase calories. So if you're, you, oh. yeah. Is that you increasing too? Oh, definitely. Oh, um, yeah. oh, you're kicking yeah. ass. We're kicking ass. I mean, this is, you are doing exactly what we should be doing. What you're seeing is exactly what you should be seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, and, and I would never want you to do this right now, but you could easily go back down to 16, 1700 calories and you would lose the weight real quick off the scale. But I wouldn't want that. I think what no. you're, I think you're building, keep building really yeah. good muscle. I think you're actually in a really good place calorie wise. I bet your energy is probably good. Libido's good. Sleep is good. I bet your hair, skin, nails, you probably notice improvements in all that stuff. It's excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, you're oh man, you know, you're killing it. Uh, Kath, I'm so glad you're, I'm so glad you're on this episode because you know what this highlights is um, just how terribly advertised to women are, especially like for you to question your own body, like you feel good, your hair is good. You're sleeping good. Energy, I'm stronger. Eating my hus more. My husband says I look better. <laughs> I feel my energy's better. I got better libido. Yeah, something's wrong though. And then yeah. you're like, oh, but I gained three pounds. Uh, am I right? Like you're it's like you're it's like it's terrible because uh our media and our advertising, all, all the messaging is making you question yourself. And how our clothes are made. Yeah, too. imagine clothes if clothes are just not made imagine for if athletically you were, fit people. Yeah, imagine if you were like a you know, a, a 19 year old girl who just started figuring this out. You're gonna you're gonna probably go in the opposite direction and start starving yourself again. And going the wrong way, you're killing it. I would take this. Throw your scale away, seriously. Yeah. And and yeah. And, and just keep listening to the signals of how you feel, your performance in the gym, and pay attention to the non, you know, body fat related, weight related things like hair, skin, nails, libido, mood, energy. Yeah. Like those are wonderful signals to pay attention to, because they will tell us whether we're going the wrong direction or the right direction. Oftentimes, I'm not against you going and, and testing your body fat so you have a, a, an objective number that you can look back. But and, look at the trends, though. Don't, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I what I would do is I'd go get it right now. Then I would throw the scale away. I wouldn't even. I would continue doing what you're doing, and then in a month or two, check yeah. back in and look at your results, and, yeah. and and it'll 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 highlight the good work that you're doing right now. I think you're I think you're on a perfect track. If you were a client of mine. The only thing we're changing is our workouts. Yep. That's the only thing I'm changing. The way the the sounds like the food and everything is going, like I'd be very happy. And it sounds like your husband is got is can see that and is trying to tell you that. So we're, we're here to remind you right now too. Okay, so the twenty three hundred is that that's a solid range. Like, can that's, I keep doing like three weeks of that, then kind of cut back down to two thousand every third week? Sure. Like, I mean, it's that's all relative, right, on the individual. But I like okay. I like where they're at. But I would ask you, how do you feel eating twenty two hundred calories? Do you feel satisfied? I, I can't believe I can eat this much food and oh. I haven't gained more weight. Like it's incredible. <laughs> but do do you feel good though? Does it feel like yes. okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, there's nothing wrong with uh, there's nothing wrong with doing uh, twenty two hundred calories for a couple more weeks and then maybe running a, a, a one week of eighteen hundred calories then going up to twenty three hundred calories. Yeah, I would keep going up. I would slowly. keep I would keep stair laddering you up I'm, and every it, yeah. and every every three weeks or so and 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 some of this if you're a client of mine sometimes I'll do this just to give them the mental relief of, and to get them to trust my process of like listen you're doing good watch watch we're gonna cut calories for a week and then they see like the three pounds come off the scale and they're like oh my god look how and i'm like yeah that's because we are building muscle we are sculpting we we're building a great physique now let's go up to 2300 calories then we go to 2300 calories for like three weeks then i let them have another week where i cut them back down again and then I go back and just i'd keep stair stepping you up until i've got you eating 26 27 2800 and you're just blown away by how many calories yeah it's that's sustainable you know what i mean that's like it's great it gives you so much flexibility to go on a vacation or a trip 
or to go out to eat, you know, now you can eat more and not, and your body's burning it. That's what, always keep that in mind. And anybody who's listening right now, that's one of the advantages of continuing to, to increase the, the, your ability to, to maintain on a higher calorie is really for the flexibility, the sustainability for the time. Yeah. So you and your husband can go out and have a nice dinner and you can order dessert and wine and not feel like it sticks to you right away, which is what, how people explain that. Oh man, I have one bad night and I feel like it sticks to me. Well, that a lot of times it's because their caloric maintenance is at 1500 calories yeah. and one heavy 800 calorie meal is literally half of their calorie intake. But when you get to a place where you're eating 2,800, 2,900 calories a day and you have an 800 calorie meal, ain't a big yeah, deal. No. You know, it's a, it's a, it has a lot to do with that. So that should be kind of the goal is to keep inching those calories up uh, and, and just building muscle and putting yourself in a place where you have a lot of uh, flexibility nutritionally. Okay. I think that was my question. How far can I keep inching? Because I am, I moved it up to 2,300. So I'll keep going a few more. Yes. Yeah. You'd um, be, su you'd be surprised, uh, you know, but it, there's an individual variance there, but I wouldn't be, I would, I would, I would expect based off of what you're telling me that we could probably get you around 25, 2,600 ca calories. Comfortably. Easy. Yeah. Comfortably. Easy. I mean, okay. The one number I don't know is how's your movement throughout the day? Do you track steps or you have any idea about how, how, how much you she move? She got three kids. I guarantee she's <laughs> yeah. moving like crazy. I, uh, I, not as much as you think. I'm a CPA, so I'm pretty much at my desk. But um, mm. I did an, an average, and I'm at about 6,500. Okay. okay. So you could, so there's room to move more, okay? So I like to do this, too. As, like, as, I'm, uh, as I'm challenging clients like you who are, are a little nervous to keep moving the calories up in fear of the weight, I also sometimes will move steps up. So I might go, okay, Catherine, I'm going to bump you up to – 2,400 calories now, but now I want you to make sure that every day you get 9,000 steps and that, okay. that, that, that becomes our goal. And then you, then we get level there and I go, okay, cool. We're not gaining any weight. And I go, okay, now I want to push you to 25 or 2,600 calories. And let's make sure we get 10,000 steps every day. And I kind of will stair step a little bit of movement with you. So we don't okay. see this major surplus or, or, or a swing in the weight that much. And there is room for you to be more active. Like you're only doing, that's, that's not bad. Like the average American is like 3,500. So you're doing better than the average person. But if you walked like 15 minutes after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that yeah. would add a couple thousand steps easily. Yeah. That's a great goal okay. or, or a you know, lunch break. And that's just good for health. Yeah. Okay. And then one more thing, if you have a minute. Yeah. 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 Uh, any suggestions on what program to run next? I think we have most of yours. You're, um, you're on anabolic advanced. Then you did aesthetic. I mean, I just started aesthetic. Yeah. Okay. So that's a lot of volume. Okay, Performance so, or symmetry. Maybe? Yeah. I would want you to do a scale back on, on volume. Cause you went from anabolic advanced to aesthetic. Aesthetic is a lot of volume. So at the end of that, you might, it would probably be a good idea to scale the volume down to get the body to continue to progress. So, okay. and, and, and work on, uh, you know, different planes of movement. I like performance. Yeah. I like performance or so symmetry. Map performance or map symmetry would be a good follow up. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You got right, it. Catherine. Yeah. Good job. Keep kicking ass, huh? There you go. All right. Bye-bye. Does, does, okay. Does, <laughs> Talk does about like, anything illustrate yeah. like what a position people are in? She's like, I'm stronger. Yeah. I feel better. All the metrics that we yeah. talked about. I can't believe what how more do you need? I can't believe how much I'm eating. Yeah and, yeah. and it's a three, three pounds. Yeah. yeah. Three. I could, you know, three pounds on a scale. And she's like, I'm questioning whether or not I'm moving in the right direction. Yeah. That is so sad to me. And, and also keep a, you, you guys have heard me share this. I mean, this was the part I, I think I, I really was got a, a good grasp of like how easily we can fluctuate three pounds. I mean, like, that's exactly three pounds. It, yeah. If you, if you go from eating 1700 calories, let's yep. say on normal and you're all the way up to 2200 calories and you're exercising you just the, the carbohydrate, sodium and water intake mm -hmm. from that will be, so she's, there's a good chance. She's actually lost body fat. I think yeah, she did. Exactly. And built muscle. If she got stronger, like she said, and she just started strength training, what, yeah. like what she did, like, like 12 weeks ago, something yeah. like that. And if she's so. potentially eating three to 500 yeah. more calories every single day, yeah. she literally probably lost body fat and she's in like the Goldilocks zone. Totally, she yeah. she yeah. lost body fat, probably put on muscle and is eating more than she ever has. Like three pounds is so insignificant. I could drop that three pounds in one day. Body composition is completely yeah. changing. Cut her calories, cut back a little bit on some sodium, and I, that in seventy two hours, all that that weight would come right off. It's Easy. mostly water. That I she just ate a three pound burrito the other day. It was <laughs> it <did>. Look, <laughs> shit the whole thing out. If you <laughs> if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. They're free, they're awesome, and they can help you with your fitness. 
You can also find us all on Instagram. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. I'm at Mind Pump to Stefano. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. 